It is now nine o'clock. Something I couldn't do on Zoom would use the gavel. Call the meeting to order of the June 24th uh, meeting of the regular meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation. Uh, Deborah, roll call. But first, I need to read the audio announcement. Please do so. Thank you. This is a reminder to everyone that audio and video recording photography is taking place in Peacock Hall in connection with the broadcast live streaming over the internet of today's board meeting. By entering and by your presence here and after reading this notice, you are hereby irrevocably consent to be photographed, filmed, recorded, and to use any of your likeness, voice, name by Golden Rain Foundation of Walnut Creek in any and all media whatsoever in perpetuity for any lawful purpose whatsoever without compensation. If you do not agree to be recorded or on film, do not enter this area. Or alternatively, if you don't want to be on the recording, you may sit in the last three rows of this theater. Please turn off all personal devices, cell phones, uh, those running Zoom application in conjunction with this meeting because it will cause feedback to our recording. Thank you. And now roll call. Walker. Here. Stumfell. Here. Hamaji. Here. Hurt. Here. Bentley. Here. Brown is excused. Flaherty, I believe, is excused. Harrington. Here. Madaraki. Here. Okay. Here. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, you have the meetings in your packet, or the minutes uh, from the meeting of May 27th, a meeting in your packet. Any changes or additions? Seeing none, they are approved as submitted. And now we have a, a special guest today. I'm very pleased that the mayor of Walnut Creek uh, saw fit to come and visit us. Uh, mayor Wilk, we are pleased to have you live in Rossmore. Thank you so much. Thank you, Golden Rain Foundation and, and people of Rossmore. It is good to be out, isn't it? It's, uh, it's been a long year and three months, and in fact, um, as, as I'll talk about, we actually just uh, had our first meeting in city council in person last week. So um, good to see all of your faces from the nose down too. Uh, all right, well, there's a lot of information that's happened and I appreciate the opportunity to let you know about what's happening here. First, I wanna talk about our priority updates. For those that may be familiar, and maybe there are plenty of people that don't, the city council voted on five priorities at our uh, March meeting to take us through the next couple of years. Now, priorities are things that Walnut Creek gives a little extra emphasis to and uh, that are, go beyond the regular maintenance or day-to-day -day activities that the uh, city may be performing in. So those five updates are infrastructure, and we, uh, we may have had our buildings closed for a year, but the buildings continue to age by year, so there's a lot to talk about there social welfare and public safety. And as we saw that there were a lot of different social welfare issues that happened over the last year, and that includes homelessness, and includes also public safety with health as well as police safety. So those are things that we're working on as well. We have uh, diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And there's a lot that we've been doing in this area. The next thing to come up on this will be our task force interviews for DEI. And those are occurring right now. We also have our climate change update that'll take us through to 2030. Uh, I know that the Rossmore has Sustainable Rossmore and there's several different uh, sustainable clubs and organizations that are within Contra Costa. We have a lot to move forward on there. We are currently in phase two of that program. That'll be coming to the city council in the fall and we'll be then approving some of the different issues that we'll be moving on when it comes to climate change. Very important, of course, fire, water now is, is part of this as well, and a uh, lot to move forward on in there. And then we also have our, uh, our general economic development. So with economic development, usually Walnut Creek, of course, has been just on an upward trajectory, and now we have to take a step back, look to see what we can do to help those businesses that have really been hurt in, during the pandemic, and what we can do to move forward there. I'll talk about that a little bit more afterwards. We also approved our budget in the last meeting, and, uh, and that'll take us through for the next couple of years as well. With the budget comes a couple of different issues that'll be important to people in Rossburg to know about. One is the homeless outreach program, 
And the homeless outreach program uh, continued through until about April, May of last year when everything shut down and uh, really when it came to homeless, it was less about providing them direction of where to go for different services, just making sure that we could keep account for them for, for testing and eventually for vaccinations. But the homeless outreach program is moving forward again. It'll be starting in July. We have our two officers already assigned to that. And we're going to be starting our own core program, which is mental health um, advocacy and helping the mentally ill when it comes to what we need to do with them in the county. And so previously on those kind of crisis responses, uh, we have partnered with Concord. Concord's now going at it on their own due to a tax measure. So Walnut Creek now has decided to go on its own as well and we, are, we have come up with the budget for that. Along those lines, you've probably heard of a 24-7 mental health crisis response team that, that uh, Measure X funds will help when it comes from the county. Walnut Creek's taken a leadership position in that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's some different names for it. One of them is the Miles Hall um, Community Hub, and that'll be the call center area. And of course, Miles Hall was tragically killed in Walnut Creek a couple of years ago. And so there's, uh, th this is one of the things that we can do to help honor his name. And that will be coming in the fall. The idea there is that there will be a different number and a different call center that can be used when people have a mental health crisis response outbreak. For example, um, the state bill that's sponsored by our own assembly member, Rebecca Bauer Cahan, is AB 988, otherwise called the Miles Hall Lifeline Act, where you would call 988 to reach a mental health crisis response that would be an unarmed police response as opposed to 911. So all of these are working in conjunction with each other. We'll hear a lot about this in the months to come. And we also approved ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds that will be used to help close some of the gaps that occurred during the downturn, which also includes homelessness, downtown funds, and downtown enhancement. So all of this was approved. Been a busy couple of months with the city council. Uh, one of the things that is my pride and joy is that the mayor has an initiative every year. So the, as uh, we had Walnut Creek together in the previous year, and there's been different uh, mayor initiatives pretty much every year. Uh, mine was recognizing Walnut Creek heroes. And it's people that have gone above and beyond the call of duty uh, that typically aren't recognized. They're just people that are really wanting to come and help their fellow people. And we honored three people. One is Karen Mariner, who created a cleanup crew that has picked up litter uh, that has been built up over the past year. And she got a crew of 400 volunteers to help throughout Walnut Creek for that. And one is a Northgate High School student, and his name is Sina Farhadi, who organized a tutoring program for the homeless and foster youth students who have needed extra help during the pandemic. And for any of you that have children or grandchildren that have been dealing with online studying, I have, I have uh, two children, one of whom is in college right now, and that is tough where everything is online and you don't have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the teacher necessarily. So that is really terrific that this Northgate High student took it upon himself. And then we also honored Fran Gibson, who many people may know in Rossmore. She's the president of Rossmore Emergency Preparedness Organization. And she has brought experts via Zoom to the Rossmore community to help residents survive through COVID and plan for other emergencies as well. And it's, I, I'm so happy to hear about and be able to honor these three. And of course, this is it's the second time that we've done these honoring of Walnut Creek heroes. Also the second time that somebody from Rossmore was recognized because when we recognized them previously, uh, Mark and Marilyn Weiss from Rossmore were recognized for their help as well when it came to uh, helping to feed people that were really needing some help during the pandemic. Uh, so th this is something that I want to continue to make sure that we are recognizing and also get those nominations in. We're going to be not opening up the nomination period for the next recognition. That's going to be happening in July, getting those nominations in. So keep an eye out for it. It's on the Walnut Creek City website. And we actually, every person that's nominated, we put on the city website and then the Citizens Institute of um, graduates of Walnut Creek get together, discuss the nominees, and then vote on who those three recognitions go to. I also want to mention that, much like yourself here, City Hall is open 
open for business with the public. There are some services that are still online and you should make appointments when you do need to go into City Hall uh, in person. But we are open and welcoming uh, everybody. It's, been, <laughs> it's, it's great to see people there. And again, City Council's now in person as well. Uh, and then I did want to mention uh, at the end here, we are talking more about outdoor dining and what can we do to help keep this going, but also understand there may be some modifications that are needed. For example, how do we uh, want to work with the restaurants that are right next to retail establishments that you know, may look at outdoor dining as a little bit more intrusive than perhaps people that are just enjoying the experience. So uh, we're talking about that, but the city council has given direction to continue it for the foreseeable future. We actually took a uh, survey recently of, Wa of Walnut Creek residents. 82% said they definitely wanted outdoor dining to continue. 10% said they maybe wanted it to continue. So 92% is pretty strong. And we are looking into that right now. You'll hear more about that. And finally, Walnut Creek Convention and Visitors Bureau launches a new look and logo. Anybody coming in or out of the uh, Oakland Airport, for example, sees a big banner about Walnut Creek right now. Business tourism is down, but we're out and about to let people know that we're, at, that we're open, we're ready for them, whether it's outdoors or indoors. And that's my report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, any questions for the Mayor? Dale? Uh, mayor Wilk, I do have a question, but before I ask that, I would like Fran Gibson to stand up. Please, Fran. She was one of the honorees. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Fran. Congratulations. <laughs> um, Mayor, um, in terms of uh, homeless uh, referrals for homeless people, do you have enough agencies or resources, or, or are we short uh, and, and lacking in resources? Well, I mean, on a general sense, I think every community is probably lacking in, in the total resources that could be used. However, between the Tr Trinity Center yes. and between our homeless outreach program that will now be starting in, in just next week, that's going to be a huge help. We have to remember that people that are homeless, some don't want to be right in four walls and a ceiling. And even our winter shelter nights has shown that where we have beds available every night in the winter because people either uh, they, they want to have their pet with them and they're not able to, or they have to be clean and sober. So there's all sorts of issues. But we feel that we have the resources to really be able to manage and, and mitigate the issues. That doesn't mean we're going to solve it. When right. people ask me, what are you going to do to solve homelessness? You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm sorry to say there just isn't an answer for how do we solve it. We can help to mitigate it keep a handle on it. Uh, we have about 70 homeless in Walnut Creek right now. It's hard to count, but that's the best count that we have, about 70. And uh, we're, we're just trying to give them the services they needed. Some may be looking for a home. Some just may need those extra help and support, showers, some food, uh, just some stability, and we want to be able to help with that as well. And we also need to recognize that homelessness isn't the person that might be lying behind a building somewhere that's trying to spend the night there. It could be somebody living in their car. And right. it, it could be somebody that we might not even know that, that has a job and they just can't afford housing. And so affordable housing works into that as well. Thank you very much. I'm familiar with Trinity Center, so I know the resources there. Thank you. Sure. All right, any other questions for the mayor? Well, thank you very much, and uh, keep our city safe and, and uh, financially stable, and we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. You got it. Thank you, and keep on going on. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next up is the financial status report, and I'm looking at Mary Hurt. Thank you, Dwight. I'm pleased to uh, report that the revenues are over budget by 345,000, 3.1% 3, 3 for the first five months of 2021. The major contributor to this favorable balance continues to be golf revenue at 278,000. Total expenses, on the other hand, were under budget by 179,000, 1.6%. 1 
Unfilled positions contribute to the reason for most of this favorable expense. Year to date, revenue of 11592 exceeded expenses of 10 million by 700000 Excuse me, I have to get back up to this other screen. For MOD, revenue was under budget by 102000 for the first five months. The major contributor to this unfavorable balance was building maintenance activity. Total expenses were under budget by 268000 or 6.1%. Compensation costs related to building maintenance was the major reason for this favorable expense balance. Total year-to-date revenue of 4,359,000 exceeded expenses of 4,153 by 206,000. Okay, whoops, whoops, sorry. Whoops, my screen is moving. For GRF and MOD operations combined, revenue was over budget by 243,000 or 1.5% for the first five months. Total expenses were under budget by 446,000 or 2.9%. Year to date revenue of 15 million exceeded expenses of 15 million by 900,000. Oops. Sorry. My screen's going away from me. For trust fund activity, the membership transfer fee for the month and year to day were 480,000, 1,980 respectively. Membership transfer fees for the same year to date period in 2020 were 1,280,000, which represents a 55% growth rate. Oops. All right, I'm not doing this well. Cash and debt pension liability positions. Total cash is 13,161 as of the end of May, which consists of a 7,377,000 for GRF. MOD at 289 and the trust at 5.495. The forgiveness application for the payroll protection program has been submitted to the Small Business Administration. It was submitted on June 9th and we, on June 9th, we received official notice that the loan has been forgiven. However, we are still subject to the audit by the Small Business Association. The PPP loan amount is 3,570,000 as is, and and is still included as a liability at the end of May. At the end of May, the principal bank loan balance is 13,525,000. The pension liability is 12,090,000. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you, Mary. Any questions for Mary? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, our esteemed CEO, Tim O'Keefe. Thank you. Thanks, Dwight. Well, welcome back to the Peacock Hall and uh, Gateway Clubhouse. We are, um, I, you know, there's been a, there were about five staff members that operated out of the Gateway Clubhouse over the last uh, 16 months. And it, the Gateway Clubhouse is a really big facility. And for five people, we often wouldn't see each other through the whole day. But um, it's nice to be back and nice to have you back um, and all of us not having to wear masks. So. I'm gonna give you an update on uh, really where we're at with the pandemic status as it affects Rossmore. Um, so when the governor relaxed the, um, the COVID restrictions on June 15th, we opened up that day, but we didn't go gangbusters. We didn't open up everything exactly the way things were before. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So first up, the reservation systems for the pools and the fitness center, those went away on June 15th. And I, and I know a lot of people liked it. They felt that it was very efficient, although, you know, obviously with the pool capacity is much greater than the number of people we were allowed to put in the pools. There was a lot of frustration from residents who wanted to be in the pool. 
or wanted to make appointments for the fitness center as our most popular amenity, and we were limited to, I think, about less than 20 people in the fitness center at a time. So we're glad to have those restrictions go away. Golfers can now share golf carts. That was a major point of frustration for the golf community. Social distancing is no longer required on the lawn bowling greens or the bocce courts, table tennis. So all of that went away with the governor's announcement. Gateway Studios are now open. Concerts and performances have begun. The first concert, I think, was in the plaza last Friday. I, I know they had uh, their last Zoom concert at the event center, I think, uh, this past weekend. And they're, gonna, they're planning for their first live event uh, coming soon. The, so clubs can now meet again. They've made their appointments for the clubhouses, so uh, we expect the rooms to be filled up here soon. And of course, card games can now commence. And I know that's a real popular activity here in Rossmore. But there are some limits. So we, we as I said, we, we didn't go gangbusters and open up everything exactly the way it was before. Under the health order, unvaccinated people still must wear masks if you're indoors. And it's on the honor system. So the, the previous board of directors here for the Golden Rain Foundation decided that it did not want to implement its own passport or vaccination verification system. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Logistically, it's difficult to, to do. Um, with the state not mandating a passport type system, there is no reliable way to verify people's vaccination status. The, the CDC cards can easily be forfeited. So there just wasn't a good way to do that. And, and then there's liability and, and uh, uh, the violation of, of possibly the privacy matters, violation of people's privacy that was a concern. So we, don't, we are not doing any vaccination verification. It's on the honor system. So if you are not vaccinated inside any of our spaces, any of our buildings, uh, you are required by law to wear a mask. And, but it's, it's you, on, on you to, to comply. Uh, the, the health order also allows buses to run at capacity. So we were limited previously to two people on a bus at a time due to social distancing. And now there is no restriction on the number of people on our buses. And there, I think there's 17 person capacity, including the driver. So we can be full, although that even pre-pandemic, it was rare to have a full bus. Uh, but everybody on a bus is required under the law to be masked. You, you must, whether you're vaccinated or not, you must wear a mask if you're on public transportation. So that applies to BART, the county connection, and our buses as well. Uh, let's see, We're gonna, we are going to continue, or going to implement, I should say, some limitations on capacity in rooms. So this hall, Peacock Hall, for movies, for this meeting, uh, we are limited to 50% capacity. So if, um, I, we don't usually run into that problem here at GRF board meetings, but for uh, the movie theater, it's, it's quite popular, and um, we will be limiting it to 50% capacity. And again, if you're indoors, unvaccinated, you must be masked the entire time you're, you're watching a film here. Now, the clubs can have more restrictions than Golden Rain or the state um, is requiring. So um, don't be surprised if your favorite club requires you to wear a mask when you all get together or doesn't desires not to have, say, a potluck, or to serve food, or to share food, and that kind of thing. Don't be surprised if a club has those kinds of restrictions. And please don't be upset at the club for doing that. I, I think that we want to recognize that everybody has different levels of tolerance and comfort with the changes that have you know, fairly rapidly occurred in the last um, nine days. So it's going to take a while, I think, for people to be acclimated um, to being, you know, shoulder to shoulder to, with people. Fortunately, we, or fortunately or unfortunately, today we had two of our colleagues out on a, on a medical for medical issues, and we're not here at this table. But we would normally be a lot closer to each other, sitting up here at the front. So uh, we recognize that everybody's not quite comfortable yet being that close to each other. So we're going to continue with this, and and the board had previously given us direction to to operate cautiously. Um, there was not. Um, a directive from the board to just go gangbusters and open up everything back to the way things were. So we want to recognize the fact that 100% of the residents in the Rossmore community are susceptible to the virus and worse, dying from the virus. And so we want to recognize that there is a high risk here, vaccinated or not. 
Uh, the vaccines are not 100% effective. Uh, there are people who have been vaccinated that have gotten COVID, but fortunately it, it appears that uh, if you have been vaccinated, the symptoms are much lessened or severe, and you have a much less chance of dying from the disease if you are vaccinated. So all of that is, uh, I think, positive and good, and over time we will continue to follow the guidance from the public health officials locally and at the state level and the federal level and modify our protocols accordingly. Let's see. Um, so I want to point out then some, some things that have changed and some improvements that our previous board of directors had authorized. And the first is that I want to make clear that no one in Rossmore is required to come into any building. So we can work around that. We can work with you outdoors. You can meet staff outdoors. If you have a reason to meet, say, the, the folks up at MOD, we're happy to, to meet, meet with you in the parking lot. There's some picnic tables up there where we can sit. Um, so we're not, uh, we want to recognize, again, that people are not comfortable yet uh, all getting in, inside public spaces. So, so only come into a clubhouse if you are personally comfortable. Don't feel that you have this obligation if you're fearful of, of entering a building. But I want to point out to you a few things that we've improved since uh, we were last opened more than a year ago. So the first is that the air filtration systems in all of our buildings have been upgraded. Um, I should say in m most of our buildings, um, and I'm going to get a little technical with you, there's a thing called um, there's a rating system for air filtration systems called MERV. It's an acronym, and I don't ask me what it stands for. It's Mechanical Engineering something, I think, um, M-E-R-V. And so we've upgraded in most of our facilities to what's called a, it's called a MERV 13 air filter. These are large filtration systems that not every building can accommodate or every uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system can accommodate. But the board authorized us to invest in that Last year, so last spring, we went through a process and evaluated all of the air filtration systems in all of our buildings and upgraded them to MERV 13, which is the best we can get for things like viruses and the like. In addition, last year, the board authorized um, a, a, um, another system that, over, that, that supplements the, the filtration system, and it's called needlepoint bipolar ionization. And so the air is not just filtered mechanically, it's also filtered electronically with this needle point bipolar ionization. And so it's an additional sterilization. And what it does is it breaks down the molecules into, um, into a different size that can be better treated by the actual filtration systems. That's the limit of my technical knowledge about this. So I apologize, I might have flubbed it just a little bit, but I think that's the general gist of what that type of the needlepoint bipolar ionization is doing to supplement our filtration systems. Now, in those, there's a couple of facilities that we were unable to upgrade uh, to the MERV 13 filters. And in those facilities, we have supplemented the MERV 8 or MERV 10 filters with uh, HEPA filters as well. So, um, but most of our facilities are now MERV 13. And in addition, all of our facilities have, we've increased the frequency of air exchanges, fresh air exchanges that are occurring. So for the last like 70 years in the construction and building industries, the mechanical engineering field, the focus has been on energy efficiency. So for 70 years, all commercial buildings have, have been designed to minimize bringing in fresh air into buildings because it costs a lot more money and energy to heat or cool air that you're bringing in from the outside. So, but now with, with, a, with a pandemic, it's, it's more advantageous for all of us to increase the frequency of fresh air interchanges. So we've done that for all of our buildings. They've all been significantly expanded in terms of the number of times per hour that fresh air is being drawn into the buildings. It's gonna increase our energy usage, just so don't be surprised in over the next year or so, if our electric and gas usage is going up, it probably will. Um, but it's because we're, we're using, we're bringing in a lot more fresh air, which requires more energy to heat and cool. Um, I also want to point out a few other things that we've, other changes that you're going to see. Um, so when you come into any of the Golden Rain facilities that are staffed, 
So if you come in here at Gateway, come to the recreation, the, the front counter there at the recreation department, or if you go up to MOD, you go to the Rossmore News, and there's staff, uh, you will find the staff behind plexiglass shields, large plexiglass shields, not just a face mask, but, but a large, it looks like glass, a large structure that's in front of each staff member. And that's to protect our staff and the residents, just in case there's viruses floating around in the air. Um, so, it, it, but it does make the ability to hear a little more difficult. It, you, so just be, keep that in mind that the staff member is gonna have difficulty hearing you, you're gonna have difficulty, may have difficulty hearing the staff member, and especially if you're masked, it, it makes it even harder to hear people. So just be aware of that. You have to speak a little bit louder to be heard both in, on either side of the glass and, uh, and then if you're masked, just be aware that it's gonna require some uh, additional projection for, for you to be clearly heard. Um, appointments are also going to be required in several places. So the Rossmore News, um, Gateway, if you're meeting with a recreation staff member for whatever reason to make a res room reservation or to buy a ticket for a show or something, you do need to make a reservation with the staff member and also at MOD in the afternoons. So what we've learned through the pandemic is that we can actually operate remotely. All of us have figured that out with Zoom and, and the other tools. But the, um, at, uh, at MOD in particular, that's a high, uh, it's a very busy place with a lot of people coming and going throughout the day. And residents before the pandemic would often get frustrated. They would come up to MOD, make an appointment, or they didn't have an appointment system at the time. They come up to MOD, they wanna meet with an alterations person, or they wanna meet with somebody that they've got a problem in their building and that person is not available for 30 minutes or an hour or two hours or three hours because they've got other people that they're meeting with. And that frustrates, has frustrated the residents and it frustrates the staff that we can't be accessible. So what we did through the pandemic was we had a, an appointment system and you could you can make an appointment with an MOD uh, a person and they will then, uh, you'll have a, a time and the, and the staff member will make sure that they are available at that time. So as we are now transitioning to opening things up, we are gonna stick with an appointment system at MOD for the afternoons. We're gonna to continue to allow walk-ins in the mornings, but in the afternoons it will be exclusively by appointment. And so we're gonna try this for a little while and see. It does improve the efficiency. I think it reduces the frustration for residents to have an appointment instead of going up and waiting in a line or waiting for you know, half an hour, an hour or longer to meet with somebody or to turn away because you, no one's available to help you that day and that gets frustrating. So we're gonna try this for a little while. I wanna make sure the board's aware of that and that the residents in the community are aware too. So again, it's the Rossmore News, MOD and Gateway are the three primary areas that will all require appointments. Uh, let's see. And, and so the last item on, on this is that um, when you come into any of our facilities, you will find hand sanitizers. They will be available near the doors. So use them when you come into the buildings, use them when you leave the buildings. The, our facilities will be sterilized or sanitized, I should say, um, periodically. Um, so our custodians will be wiping down the high touch surfaces like door handles and countertops and that kind of a thing. Um, but uh, Dr. Chris Farnitano, who is the county's um, medical officer, uh, or I should say health officer, he, uh, he's continuing to recommend that you continue to sanitize. Bring wipes with you, keep them in your purse or your pocket, keep them in your car, wipe down your steering wheel, wipe down your hands, anything that you've touched. Just get in the habit of doing that. And while the health officials tell us that they believe that COVID-19 primarily moves via the air, it does land on surfaces and, and, and theoretically it can exist on surfaces for some extended period of time. And so it can transfer you. When you touch that and then touch your face or, or touch a, a, a drink glass or something like that, you can transfer, potentially transfer the virus, even if you're vaccinated. So uh, Dr. Farnitano is continuing to advise people to use sanitizers and using them frequently. So that's the update on the pandemic. And we just are thrilled to have you all back here in this room together and, and uh, have all of us. And, and we have six board members that are new to GRF since the last time we had a live meeting. So this is the first time they've seen each other, although we had a, we had a board retreat yesterday. So that was actually the first time they got to see each other. But I um, wanna welcome the board members back, welcome the staff back and, and, uh, and the residents. So I'm, I'm gonna now touch on Zoom, Zoom meetings. 
So we've had some interest, uh, clearly a lot of interest in uh, participating in governance at the, at the GRF and at the mutual level throughout the community. Zoom was a great equalizer. It made it more convenient for everybody to not have to get dressed up, not have to get in your car and come down to Gateway to, to attend a meeting. Uh, Zoom made it very convenient. And I'm not going to I'm not going to divulge which board members were wearing their pajamas uh, below th when they were on Zoom um, and wearing a nice shirt on, or a blouse uh, on the screen. But um, Zoom did make it very convenient, and we did see significant uh, increase in participation as a result of Zoom. So we have been testing whether Zoom could work concurrently to having a live meeting, having live participation with resident forum. And, and then Zoom people re working remotely from home. And what we've learned, and, and as I said, we've tested this extensively, is that you cannot have more than one Zoom microphone on in a room at a time. And that's a problem. It, it, now you think, well, what does that mean? Well, what it does is it, 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 it feeds back. There's this horrible feedback noise uh, that you audibly hear if you have more than one microphone, live microphone in a room at the same time on Zoom. So we, we tried to figure out how to minimize that. We, it just it can be done. It's a technology issue at Zoom's end. So, um, so we're not able to do that. But for Golden Rain board meetings, we have figured out a solution. So we are live today on Zoom right now, and we're live here, and there's no feedback because none of us have Zoom running on our computers at this moment. Um, we are running Zoom through the Channel 28 TV cameras and microphone system, and then there's a, a special interface that they have back in the, in the tower back here that um, minimizes that feedback. So with a single microphone, we can manage it. I should say, we all have our own microphone. We only have one Zoom microphone that's back in the, in the studio back here. So with that, that allows us to have live Zoom participation from residents that might be calling in right now to this, to this meeting and allows us to have a live meeting without the, the horrible electronic feedback. So the, we can do it for Golden Rain board meetings. We're unable to do it for Golden Rain committee meetings. So it requires really to have a dedicated staff member that's available for technical assistance and reminding all the participants to turn off their Zoom microphones, which just is not going to work in a committee meeting. So, um, and we don't have those staff resources. We'd have to increase the coupon to bring somebody on staff to be the full-time staff member that's doing uh, the technical assistance that would be required for both the participants in the meeting as well as people that are calling in that are, that are having difficulty or the feedback no sounds and, and the like. So committee meetings for Golden Rain, we will not be able to have a concurrent Zoom meeting and a live meeting. So if you want to attend a Golden Rain committee meeting, we want to encourage everybody to continue to do so, but you'll have to do it live. You'll have to come down to Gateway or wherever we're meeting for a committee meeting uh, to, have, uh, to participate in the meetings. So um, let's see. I think that that's, uh, oh, I will say that um, for clubs for Zoom, we are going to make an accommodation. So we have purchased three uh, laptops and three cameras and three microphones and three interfaces that we can use for a club meeting in, in selected locations at Hillside, Gateway, and Creekside. There's one room in each location that can be scheduled for a hybrid live Zoom and live, you know, in-person meeting. And we will have a technician set it all up. We will have the technician be there at the start of the meeting to minimize whatever the feedback noises might be, and then they will, they will leave. But there will be a fee for that for the clubs. So if a club is interested in having, continuing to have Zoom meetings with a live meeting, we'll, we will be able to accommodate that. Um, but if there's a fee to do that. Um, again, for GRF, we can't, for committee meetings, we can't accommodate that without adding more staffing, um, which I don't think the board is too enthusiastic about adding staffing. So, so we're not going to be able to do that. But we will do that for a fee for the clubs, and we will be able to do it for the mutual board meetings, and there will not be a fee for the mutuals to do that. 
So that, that's how we're gonna be able to accommodate Zoom. So in three locations, in one location at each of three clubhouses, we'll be able to do a hybrid meeting, so a Zoom and live, but you'll need to coordinate that through the recreation department, make your reservations, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and, uh, and then you'll, there will be a fee for the clubs, there will not be a fee for the mutual board meetings. All right, my last uh, item here is uh, <clears throat> We're getting an acknowledgement. The Golden Rain Foundation received an acknowledgement last week, and I want to point this out to the community. Over the last year, this has been a particularly difficult year for everyone. <clears throat> I, we all recognize the, the strain and the anxiety that the pandemic has created, the fear, the health issues, the isolation, all of that. It was a very, very difficult year for everyone. I've heard from many residents um, mostly who were not happy about one thing or another. They were not happy about the closure of the clubhouses. They were not happy about um, us opening up things, you know, the swimming pools. People were upset about that. Most people that were swimmers were happy about that, but there were other people who were fearful. The golf courses, the, the shutting the golf courses down for walking last year, all these things. We've, we've heard a lot of people very upset about a lot of things. People were also upset about the health orders. And now that's nothing I can control, nothing that the city can control. That came from the county and the state. Um, but in some cases, we, we implemented more restrictions than were mandated by the county or the state. And that was by uh, directive of the board. They wanted us to be more careful. Now I want residents to understand, I've pointed this out frequently over the last year, that we are required to adhere to the health orders by law. We had to adhere under the penalty of, of fines or going to jail, which means the board president or the CEO will take one. We're not, I should say, we're not willing to take one for the team and, 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 and be imprisoned. Um, but that was in the health orders. That was actually in the order. It said that, that was, those were the penalties. So, um, so there were things that we did that were even more restrictive. But in every case, every time the health orders changed, and sometimes these were changing weekly, multiple times in a week, every single time we would run, we would have to process this. Now, this was not a single health order. I want people to understand this because a lot of people have been upset about this. This was not a single health order. There was multiple health orders for each type of business that we operate, for the maintenance staff, for outdoor recreation, for swimming pools. Each one of these had offices each one of them had a separate order that we were required to adhere to. It isn't like people say, well, we, fitness center, how come you're limited the capacity at the fitness center to 20 people? Or how come you weren't opening the fitness center? Or how come you weren't opening the indoor swimming pool? There were health, specific health orders for each one of those things. And each time we get the health order, we read it, it's, it's sometimes dozens of pages long for each one of these things. And then we would interpret it, design our safety protocols, and then run them back through the public health officials in the county to say, what do you think? Does this look like this is okay? Does this meet the health order? What else could we do to help keep our community, our demographic, with 100% of the individuals here at risk of dying from this disease? How do we keep them safe? And so the health officials would then weigh in on that, give me further recommendations and that's why things would be further refined and maybe even more restrictive than what the health orders were, were requiring. So that's the that's how we operated over the last uh, 16 months and uh, again a lot of some people weren't happy about that but I will tell you this that when all is said and done here we are 16 months later we had very very few infections in Rossmore and even more importantly I have put in my report, I was aware of one death. We actually have had three deaths that I'm aware of in the Rossmore community out of 10,000 residents. If we had mirrored what the infection and death rates were in California or Contra Costa County in January, we would have had hundreds and hundreds, maybe more than 1,000 people in Rossmore infected with COVID. That would have meant probably hundreds of deaths and we had three that I'm aware of. And, and as tragic as that is, and it, we tried our, our best to keep this community safe. Shoot, sorry.
I couldn't keep everybody safe. Sorry, just a sec. Tim, maybe, do you need a little breather? Because I want to say that the entire Rossmore community is thankful to you and your entire team for keeping all of us safe, and we applaud you and Thank your you. efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'll get, I'm recomposed, I think. So, um, so a full 10 days before the shutdown, before the state mandated the shutdown, um, on March 6th of 2020, that was when the first infection was, uh, the county public health officials announced the first infection in the county. And uh, that evening, I had, a, I had a long conference call with um, the health officials. I spoke with Anna Roth. She's the director of health services for Contra Costa County. And, and a couple of her other um, lieutenants were on the call. And we wanted to know, what does that mean? What should we do for Rossmore? Um, I wanted to make sure that they knew what Rossmore was, so there was a little bit of an education there. They, they were aware, but I don't think they've really fully understood what Rossmore was. And so we had a, a long conversation that evening. Later that night, I got on the phone with Bob Kelso, who was the board president at the time, and Jeff Matheson, who was the director of resident services. And we talked until I think about 10.30 at night that evening, trying to figure out the plan for Rossmore. We had um, a concert scheduled for Saturday evening, a concert on Sunday. We had the women's conference scheduled for Monday. We had movies running all weekend long. And we decided, um, I think around midnight, uh, Jeff and I, that um, we needed to start shutting things down. And then at that time, you know, there was only one infection in the whole county. Um, but the uh, health officials were very, very concerned about the risks to the older older population, the older demographic in the county, and especially here. And so they recommended that we shut anything that we could shut down and any large events to scale back, scale down, reduce the capacity of those events. So all of our class activities, we would cut in half. We shut the movie theater down. This room was shut down. Um, we, we did not have the women's conference. We canceled it. It was a sold out event. I uh, had to rebate thousands of dollars in, in fees that, that people had paid to attend that event. So, uh, and the speaker, we had to cancel the speaker, which was Nancy Pelosi's daughter, which was controversial in and of itself, but she was the speaker that year for the uh, event. So um, after all of that, um, we shut down, began shutting things down 10 days before the state mandated shutdown on March 17th. And um, last week, GRF received an award from the California Emergency Services Association, which recognized the work that we did. Tremendous award, and it's not only to you, Tim, but all of your staff. And, and again, we really appreciate all that you've done. Many, many hours, yeah. <laughs> many, many headaches, all worth it. Thank you. My last item is employee transition. So we had one employee begin their employment with Golden Rain uh, in May. Uh, Joyce Kalaling, she's our in the accounting department. We had three employees leave employment with Golden Rain in, in May. Esteban Avia, he's an equipment operator on the golf course. Mark Langford, also uh, in the golf pro shop. And Sean Port, a front desk attendant at the fitness center. That's my report. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Tim? Tim, I just wanna point out, I bought my tickets to the uh, July 4th concert on myrossmore.com which is a convenience that has been added uh, during the pandemic. And I'm not sure what all you can do on there, but uh, I got my tickets. Did you? <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, go, go to myrossmore.com. That is one of our new amenities that we've added. It's on our website. You can go to rossmore.com, and there's a link there, I think, on the, on the home page to help you get to ro myrossmore.com. And it's a way, as Dwight mentioned, to, for you to buy tickets now online and lots of other things. You can make golf reservations, you, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. And we're gonna be expanding that over time, but we, one of the things that we piloted during the pandemic was, was this new feature, and uh, we're rolling it out. It's, it's quite exciting, and it will be, make more and more things available to the Rossmore community um, through what, it's called a portal, so a web portal, through the myrossmore.com web portal that's exclusive only to you as a resident here, as a Golden Rain Foundation member, I should say. Great. Thanks. All right. Anything else for Tim? 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, Residence Forum, Deborah, or? Yes. Okay, yeah. uh, residents have up to three minutes to address the board. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the Residence Forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented and directors do consider them as they act during the meeting. For in-person in forum instructions, complete the residence forum slip and then give your slip to Deborah Rose, Assistant Secretary. Copies of handouts or notes should also be given to Deborah Rose. Zoom forum instructions. If you wish to address the board, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if, conduct, if connecting via phone audio only. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature located on the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residence forum. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. Once the residence forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Uh, at this time, we don't seem to have any in-person speakers, uh, but Lisa, do you have any forum speakers? Thanks, Leanne. Yes, we have three resident, three speakers waiting to uh, speak in the residence forum. The first is Victoria. Victoria, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address, and then you may have three minutes to address the board. My name is Victoria Feldman, 2449 Pine Knoll, number seven. And my question is, and, and I don't know a lot about this, so forgive me if I'm uh, not sounding um, uh, fully uh, educational on this subject, but um, I am concerned about the drought and I'm concerned about why or when we're gonna have standalone water recycling units uh, throughout Rossmore uh, to collect water, to divert water, to reuse water. Any, any, um, anybody help me with that one? So we don't respond directly, but there will be a presentation later in the meeting about water reclamation. Victoria. Thank you for your call. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, our next resident forum speaker is Mary. Mary, I am allowing you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address, and you may have three minutes to address the board. Hello, uh, I'm Mary Ramos. I live at 2145 Ptarmigan number one. I just have a quick question. I was looking at the, the cash uh, and it's, uh, I was trying to figure out where is the PPP money because GRF has a balance, trust has a balance, and then the PPP loan is a negative uh, against one of those balances. And my question is, is the PP money in GRF or is it in the trust? And at some point I'd like that to be clarified. Thank you, that's it. And you're doing a great job, everybody. Thank you. Well, let, let me respond you, to Mary. that. Excuse me, Lisa, but uh, PPP money was spent. So uh, there, there is no separate uh, PPP money sitting somewhere. It was spent for uh, uh, wages uh, under the parameters of the law. So it is, it is spent. Thank you, Lisa, next. Thank you, Mary. Uh, our next uh, speaker is, and final speaker is Susan. Susan, I'm allowing you to, talk, to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address, and you may have uh, three minutes to address the board. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me okay? We can. Uh, so I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, first, thank you, Tim, for an update on the pandemic. And I wanted to add that there are other conditions that people may be wearing masks inside indoors and besides the fact that they're not vaccinated and that is the condition of uh, an autoimmune disorder and if they're on an immune suppressant they do they do don't really know what uh, the immune status is they don't know what kind of immunity one gets while you're taking an immune suppressant for these people who have this disorder 
So people who are maybe uh, people will have to continue masking indoors and take the usual precautions like distancing six feet if you're in this group of people. And I just wanted to add that to a very fine talk that Tim gave us on the pandemic. Thank you. I forgot to add my address. I'm 2625 Tarnigan. Thank you, Susan. Um, Mr. President, that was our final resident forum speaker. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And actually that worked out well with Zoom. So thank you everybody on Zoom for your participation. Next up is resident uh, member committee reports, aquatics advisory. Brian Stack, while you make your way to the podium, I wanna thank you for volunteering to chair another year on aquatics advisory committee. And we thank you for your great service to Rossmore members. Right. It's my pleasure. Um, I, I wanted to um, also thank the board and, and Tim and uh, GRF staff for the great job they did during the pandemic. Um, uh, it was amazing to see uh, just through the eyes of the aquatic committee um, how Hideo and the senior staff um, educated the new hires and got them up to speed quickly and to see how they responded with compassion and concern to the residents' uh, needs during that time. Um, they did a great job diffusing some little untenable situations we ran into sometimes at the pool where people would have uh, differing concerns. They did a professional job and, and uh, served the community really well during that time, and I want to thank you guys again for your support. Um, we reopened the pools without reservations. Seems to be going well. Uh, the talk I'm hearing around the pool is people are happy to be back to some kind of normal situation there. Um, we're working on uh, our next uh, agenda includes things like uh, looking at reopening family swim and the um, the family swim hours during the week as well as well as well as the weekends um, so we can get back to uh, full use of our facilities um, I'll take any questions if anybody's got any about aquatics any questions for Brian great okay thank you very much Brian excellent thank you next up is audit committee uh, Merrick Lipson and uh, Merrick I've had the pleasure of working with you for the past four years, I guess, on the audit committee and finally convinced you to become permanent chair. So uh, thank you for here uh, volunteering to step up to that position in the next year. Thank you. Um, on behalf of our committee, we also want to uh, thank management for their cooperation and support of the audit committee, and in particular, uh, our chief executive officer, uh, Tim O'Keefe, and our new Chief Financial Officer, Joel Lesser. Um, we met on June 7th to carry out two responsibilities that are specified in the Audit Committee Charter. First, to evaluate the performance of the external audit firm, uh, which we are required annually to do. And secondly, to review with management the status of the GRF's internal controls. The charter tells us that each year we are to look at the performance, the degree of independence, and the cost of the external audit firm. In this case, it's Shea LeBas Doberstein, who just completed their second uh, audit cycle with us. Um, Accordingly, at our meeting, uh, we heard from uh, Tim O'Keefe, from Joel uh, Lesser, and also from our accounting manager, Amanda Davis, who all expressed their full satisfaction with the work that SLD has done for the foundation. And that, coupled with the Audit Committee's own evaluation of the uh, performance by the external auditors and our review of their, uh, their work and their reports uh, led us to unanimously recommend to the board, uh, as we're required under the charter, uh, that it renew the contract. Uh, each year we either recommend renewal or uh, finding another firm, but we have no hesitation in uh, recommending that the engagement 
be renewed uh, with SLD. The other item that we uh, addressed was uh, our responsibility under the charter to assess the, uh, the quality of the internal controls of the GRF, uh, to monitor them on behalf of the board, uh, and to uh, consider uh, uh, having sessions with the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer. So that's what we accomplished, uh, or we got started on June 7th. Uh, Joel Lesser gave us a presentation describing uh, the internal controls uh, uh, of the GRF, um, reviewing how they affect uh, the operations, the reporting, uh, and the compliance uh, functions, and he uh, also briefly described some of the internal controls over financial systems here. Um, it was a start on that. We need to do more work on it, and we will, uh, and one of the uh, things that will happen at our next meeting on August 2nd is we'll get a presentation by the GRF IT department on the specific internal controls that apply to uh, the foundation's information systems, which is an area we've long been uh, concerned about. So that's going to be uh, what we'll address at our next meeting, along with uh, our annual self-assessment of uh, the committee. Uh, we did that a couple of years ago, and it was uh, very useful in giving us insights on what we should be concentrating on and what, how to schedule our next meetings. So that's my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions? Merrick, again, thank you very much. Good You're work. welcome, thank you. Next up is Finance Committee, and uh, Bill Dorban has done yeoman's work with the Finance Committee, and he can't give it up yet. So, Bill, I want to thank you for uh, taking on another year uh, on the committee as well as uh, chairing uh, the committee and appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The Finance Committee met on June the 22nd in person at Gateway. We thank Gene Autry for 14 years of outstanding service to GRF by serving on the Finance Committee. And I want to, again, publicly thank her on behalf of the Finance Committee uh, for all the work that she's done for that many years. And uh, I, uh, anyway, I wanted to make sure that that was uh, done. Uh, the committee reviewed the trust estate projections for 2021. We discussed upcoming anticipated increases in the membership transfer fee income in June. We updated our cash flow projection to show $991,000 of available, fund, available funds for capital projects between now and the end of the year if our projections are met. That's a change from numbers that we had previously given to the uh, board in the range of $600,000. CFO Joel Lesser reported that the GRF loan with Mechanics Bank of $3.57 million has been paid off by the government creating an additional surplus in the operating fund of that amount. A discussion of how that surplus should be handled was tabled until an analysis of all possible uses is presented to the committee for discussion. After discussion and evaluation, the committee would then be in a position to make recommendations and offer alternatives to the board uh, for that, uh, the use of, or the direction where those funds could be best used for the benefit of all Rossmore members, excuse me, all Rossmore residents, GRF members. Uh, I expect that that may be at our uh, August Finance Committee meeting, where then we would be able to uh, give the, uh, uh, the board additional information with that information, they, then they would be equipped, you would be equipped, and we would be equipped to then review the budget with some of those plans in mind. I think that's important uh, that those budget uh, meetings are coming up middle of September. 
Mr. Lesser also discussed an analysis of the loan covenants we have with the bank, arising from our loss of rental income from the medical center. Based on our projection of membership transfer fees to be collected through the end of the year, we should be able to satisfy the minimum required fund level by the end of the year. Uh, that's good news because uh, there were some alternatives that uh, required tying up funds or otherwise uh, reducing the loan that I do not believe at this time we will be uh, saddled with uh, by the end of the year. The committee recommends that the board approve the 2022 budget development calendar as presented by staff. The committee recommends that the board approve the 2022 operating operation budget principles as presented by the staff, but with the following change in principle number one. We would remove references to uh, the fiscal year 2021 program as being our guide and rather include uh, a, a level similar to the pre-pandemic fiscal 2020 budget. Uh, and I have the text of those two that I'll give to Mary. Uh, after reviewing the information on costs of insurance for E&O coverage and environmental coverage and upon recommendation by staff, the committee recommends that the board acquire policies with a $2 million limit for errors and omissions insurance and a $3 million limit for environmental insurance coverage. Finally, the first of six installments of the Understanding GRF Financials series was presented at that meeting. Any questions? Any questions for Bill? I think you can all see the Finance Committee is working hard on all of our behalf. Uh, there are two uh, recommendations that are before or come from the Finance Committee um, with motions. Joel, did you have anything to add to those items? Okay. Mary, do you have a motion uh, for us? Is this appropriate time to make the three motions? Let's start with one. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I basically asked, the, I, let's see, I moved that the board recommend the uh, two, two, 2022 budget development can, calendar as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. Kathleen, thank you. Any discussion, questions? Paul. Um, between June 24th and September 8th, when staff delivers the draft budget package to finance and the GRF board, there's a big gap. And I'm wondering um, the protocols for initiatives by staff, uh, GRF, and the committees to add things to the budget which may not have been included in the 2020 or been affected by the 2021 budget. So are, is there a meeting in between there when we can discuss budget priorities and things like that before, before a budget is presented, 98% of which will probably be approved? The way it normally works is the, um, the staff will submit the budget for the first review at the early September joint budget and uh, joint board and finance committee meeting. And then as part of that packet, they will separately identify any new programs, initiatives, whatever. It'll be in a, in a separate section in the budget. So um, what can happen after, well, both either before that meeting or after that meeting, either the finance committee or the board could, you know, there may be something that comes up there's a high interest in, and then they ask the staff to incorporate that into the following year's budget. So there isn't another formal budget meeting between now and the first meeting in September. At the end of September, at the board's meeting at the end of the month, that's when the budget has to be approved. So we get about a week really between the time the packet has to be prepared, which is a week in advance of the meeting, and the conclusion of the budget hearing earlier in the month, there's about one week to do the final fine tunes, you know, adjustments, any further research. It's difficult to, to propose a major initiative in that short window, 
because you know if it requires us going out and getting bids on something, we, we can't usually do that in a week. Um, it's just too difficult to get vendors to respond in, in a narrow time frame like that. So if there's a, an important initiative that the board or finance committee feels should be incorporated into the budget, I would suggest that the come up at the finance committee meeting and then the Joel would have the direction from the committee to incorporate something new into the budget. And again, that would be separately identified when the, when the formal budget is presented uh, back to the board and finance committee in early September. Okay, that, that clarifies it for me because I know that, or I recognize the fact that between the joint budget meeting with finance and the GRF, there would be little time um, to put in a ma any kind of, you know, significant new addition to the budget. Okay, any other discussion in regards to this motion? Okay, uh, ready for a vote, a roll call, Deborah. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Stumpel. Yes. Amaji. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Mataraki. Yes. Unanimous. Thank you, Deborah. Mary, did you have another motion? I move that the board approve the 2022 operation budget principles as presented, but with the following change in principle number one remove package identical to the fiscal year 2021 program and replace it with level similar to the pre-pandemic fiscal year 2020 year budget. Thank you, and is there a second? Dale, thank you. Any discussion, any questions? I think we're ready for, oh yes, Paul. Um, there was some discussion at the Finance Committee meeting about number 16. Um, the cash balance be targeted at 1.5 million. Joel, is, is that sufficient for a three month operating uh, cushion in case of emergency? Or would it be better to say a three month operating surplus or yeah, uh, good morning. Um, so I did a little bit of research uh, yesterday in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, cash flows. And just, um, so if we take a look at the, uh, the budgeted revenue and the budgeted expenditures uh, on an average basis, it is about $2.2 .2 million. So uh, the cash on hand as of the end of May is about 3.5 million. And if we take a look at that in a historical basis, as of the end of 2020, it was 3.6 million. As of the end of December of 2019, it was 2.5 million. And going back to 2018, it was 2.0 million. So the, the, ca the actual cash amounts have steadily built up to about uh, 3.5 million, which uh, if we're looking at a single month, it certainly more than covers the $2.2 .2 million worth of expenditures. So, you know, to be more conservative, I would say 1.5 million is a little light, especially if we wanna cover 1.5 million um, or three months reserves. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, uh, assuming the revenue streams are consistent with the budgeted coupon, there should be, again, no uh, cash issue. But uh, I'm just saying if the, if the desire is to have three months reserve of cash expenditures, then we're talking in excess of $6 million. So I, I don't know what the goal is, So 1.5 is okay. <laughs> One one point five, I believe, is uh, is adequate, assuming that there are no cash flow uh, problems with the collection of the coupon. So, barring a catastrophic event, 1.5 should be good. Okay. 
I have one more question, um, and that is the insurance premium costs. Um, First Mutual, as an example, has been through three years of astronomical, I would call it, insurance, property insurance increases. 50% uh, in 19, 50% in 20, and 35% this year. So um, the insurance costs, this is, I'm, I'm relating to number nine on the guidelines, uh, will be based on es estimates provided by our broker, um, A.J. Gallagher, and I'm wondering if they could not only provide us with an estimate, but a probability range on how good that estimate is. Uh, in the past three years, they started at 15, then it went to 35, it ended up at 50. This made it very difficult to budget. Um, all of the mutuals are going through that, as well as GRF. So would it be possible to get a probability range from them? So this obviously is my first uh, round at doing the budgeting yeah, and I, process. I don't so, mean to, yes. you know, <laughs> it's, I know it's uh, more of an art than a science. Um, I guess I'm trying to make GRF the board, as well as our residents aware of the fact that how hard it is in this age of fires and droughts and things like that to actually get a great estimate on some of these things which are beyond our control. So let me help answer that. So yeah. the way the insurance is priced and how we budget for it is that in the summertime, uh, I want to say around August, we get an estimate from Gallagher. And so they give us, this is not a quote, it's not a bid or anything like that. It's just an estimate based on their reading of the tea leaves in the insurance industry. And uh, so that occurs in time for us to incorporate that into our budget. So when you see that first pass of the budget in early September, that has the estimate that Gallagher has given us. Now, the last three years, uh, the estimate has been on significantly on the low side because when they, the, when the, when the policies are are formally quoted, it's after our budget is adopted. So we don't we get that information. We get the actual number because our fis, our uh, policy year starts January one, and the insurance industry just is not willing to quote out three months in advance of when a policy is going to be effective. There's just too many things that can happen in the global insurance marketplace and how they price all the risks and all that kind of stuff. And especially in these last three years where wildfires in California have just been off the charts. And the wildfires have all occurred primarily in the fall. Last year was an exception because of those lightning storms that happened in the summertime. But, but the last several years, these massive fires have occurred in the late fall when the ground is at its driest and the, you know, the shrubs and everything else. So we don't get the quote until after the budget is approved. So th that's the, the dilemma. They, they will not, it's, it's pulling teeth to get even the estimate out of them. They're uncomfortable giving us that information. They don't do it for anybody else. They just do it for us because of our budget timing is we have to do our budget, GRF's budget, in late September because that gives the mutuals then one month that they have by law to get their budgets out by November 1. So they've got one month to take our data that we give them. Here's our coupon. Here's the GRF portion of the coupon. Then the mutuals have one month to incorporate that into their, into their budget, for the, which they then have to distribute by November 1. So we, we aren't, we'll, we'll never get a probability or anything like that. They give us their, what they think their best guess is. And then each year for the last two years, we've had catastrophic losses occur right in that window of time after we had, in fact, last year, we got the quote and then we had a major fire where somebody died, four units were damaged, one was burned to the ground. That occurred after the quote. They pulled the quote back and they repriced it because you know, the policy hadn't started yet. So we, we are layered, you know, our insurance, the way the insurance works for this whole valley, which is GRF and the mutuals, 
It's very complicated. I, Paul, you've been on the Finance Committee, so you've seen it more than most people have. There's about 36 insurers that insure this valley. It's all these complicated layers of insurance. 36 insurers globally insure the Rossmore community. It's very co complex to put this package together. It's insuring about $1.3 billion of property, and that's the biggest element of the insurance package is the property insurance. Um, they can't, we didn't even have all the 36 of them in place on January 1. There was two holdouts. They didn't even have all the layers of coverage. They, it's just the, the marketplace right now is so um, risky for insurers they're, and they have an aversion to risk. And if they have an aversion to risk, they jack the prices up to make sure that their risk is covered. That's how, it, how the insurance stuff works. What Gallagher told us, they met with the mutual presidents earlier this week. And what they told us was that everybody forgets that we had, we had four consecutive years of declining insurance premiums here from uh, the, the, year, the policy year of 2017 and earlier each year, year after year, the insurance went down for four consecutive years. And then for the last three years, it's gone up dramatically. So it's just, it's indicative of the, the California market, which is particularly challenging. It's indicative of the national market and the global market. So hurricanes play into this, even though we don't have hurricanes here. Tornadoes, we don't have those in California. But it's wildfires is the big risk here. But on, and then on top of that, GRF, or the mutuals, I should say, have had some significant losses. There was the fire in First Walnut Creek Mutual just last month. Um, nine units were damaged. That's going to play into the factoring of the pricing for the, for the policy for this coming year. So each year, unfortunately, we've had large uh, casualty you know, property losses uh, for each of the last about four years now, and they, they play into that pricing. Okay. A any other questions regarding the motion? Deborah, I think we're ready for a vote. Roll call. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Stumphill? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Of course. Unanimous. And Mary, uh, did you have I, a third motion? Was it I, in regards to insurance? Yes, it is. Okay, Shall I make it at this that's, time? That's later in the agenda. I okay. think we'll wait for that. Any other questions for Bill or Joel? All right, thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, next up is um, an alum of the Fitness Center Advisory Committee, Catherine Herdering. I think, Catherine, you've been a member of that committee for nine years, chaired the last two. Uh, I think longer. Okay, longer. <laughs> my, my stats aren't up to date. Uh, but Catherine has decided to uh, step down as chair, so we thank you for the past two years of chairing the committee through some uh, tough times. And, uh, but you're staying on the committee, and uh, we appreciate your efforts going forward. Thanks, Dwight. Um, so we met on Zoom on June 9th. And, um, you know, I'd just like to say the committee, uh, not the committee, the, the fitness center staff has just done a superhuman job uh, to keep things going for us during the pandemic. Um, we closed in March uh, last year. We opened briefly, we had to close again. Uh, this enormous adaptation to um, Zoom classes, live streaming classes, personal training via Zoom. Um, the learning curve just <laughs> through the roof. Um, not only the staff, but I wanna say uh, Jeff Matheson and Mark Metcalf, just uh, remarkable um, in their ability to communicate with us and the services that they provided to residents. Um, I think we're just very blessed. Um, at our meeting, we welcomed uh, Dale Harrington as our new GRF representative. Despite the pandemic restrictions, which were lifted this Monday, uh, check-in numbers at the gym have been growing steadily. Going forward, these numbers will include people using the pools, as well as the fitness center, because everyone will check in through the front entrance. Up until Monday, swimmers were using the back patio entrance, which has now been closed, so swimmers were counted separately. Total check-ins for the gym through May 21st for this year were 9,914. Despite the need for reservations, 
the limits on numbers in the gym and closure for three months. So those numbers are just gonna explode, we expect. Revenue for the year through May 21st is $77,518. The gym reopened Monday without a need for reservations. Since our minutes were written, it has been determined that masks are no longer required um, unless one is not vaccinated. Uh, though clear plastic, plastic barriers remain in place and residents are encouraged to continue sanitizing equipment. The new state-of-the-art ventilation system gives us an added level of safety and protection. Indoor pickleball and some classes resumed June 21st. Look for new schedules on the Fitness Center website and stay tuned for updates on live stream, the addition of small group trainings and club meetings. Programs will build back gradually Guests are allowed now following pre-pandemic rules. The Pilates studio will remain closed for now because of its small size. Pilates classes will take place in the upstairs serenity room with the portable reformers moved to the sides when there are yoga classes. The fitness manager, Mark Metcalf, let us know a search is ongoing for his replacement. He will remain in the interim to provide oversight at the gym and assist with the transition. We have a new full-time trainer, Paulette Creel. She and trainer Noah Yuzna are leading the UC Davis Good Life Program, which began on Monday with 30 residents. Paulette has an impressive range of certifications, among them diabetes prevention lifestyle coach, health coach, group fitness, and senior fitness. Over time, she will be able to add to the programs and classes the fitness center can offer. One of the Rossmore lifeguards, Edwin Gomez, has filled the opened weekend position at the front desk, and two of the contracted yoga instructors, Sarah Harvey and Bonnie Maida, have decided they will not return. So this is my last report as fitness advisory chair, and I'll be turning the reins over to a very talented and qualified replacement who will be introduced later in the meeting. The next meeting of the Fitness Center Advisory Committee will be in person Wednesday, July 14th at 9.30 a.m. in the fairway room at the Creekside Complex. Going forward, the fairway room will be the committee's regular meeting place 9.30 on the second Wednesday of the month. We invite all board members and residents to join us. Any questions? Any questions for Catherine? Catherine, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Dave. take care. Now, in terms of golf, you know, sometimes priorities uh, take place. Uh, John McDonnell, uh, our chair of the Golf Advisory Committee, uh, has decided to play golf today, of all things. Uh, but we want to thank him for uh, volunteering to chair again for the upcoming year, which is terrific. Uh, normally, he would be backed up by Mark Heptig, but uh, Mark is uh, off to a golf convention. Um, so we're stuck with Ted Bentley today, the newest liaison to the golf committee. And Ted, thanks for stepping in. Okay, so um, golf has been um, amazing this year. It's been very helpful for a lot of people during COVID. Uh, through May, they've had 33,000 rounds of golf, um, and that's well on their way to hit over 80,000 rounds of golf this year. This number has not even been close to that since 1997. Um, the golf fees collected through May were uh, 714,321, and that's over budget by 200,000. Uh, and ahead of last year by over 300,000. The golf course is getting back to normal. Uh, there's actual rakes uh, in the sand traps and there's ball washers and you can actually take a flag out now when you're, when you're putting. Um, so the, uh, and also uh, people can ride in the carts two at a time. Uh, and that's really helpful with um, um, tournaments. 
Uh, yesterday they had a tournament uh, for the uh, 18ers home and home, and uh, uh, that was with Moraga Country Club and with over 100 people participating in that. Um, the pro shops, all the sales in the pro shops are way up. The uh, lessons are, um, are way ahead of last year, uh, and that is due to the number of new people who have discovered golf and are playing golf and, and really getting hooked on it. I think that this is gonna continue on because golf is not a small investment. So if you're gonna invest all that time, this should be something that's gonna, I can see this continuing on and on for, uh, for our community. And um, all the clubs are up and running and they're all starting tournaments. There's another tournament today that is going on on the first nine of the 18. And uh, they're continuing to be very busy. They're online um, um, uh, reserving your tea time is uh, the way to do it. And you, will, you can go on there and you need to almost go a week ahead of time planning on what you want to do for golf because a lot of the tea times are already taken. And it is, uh, it's been very successful to, to um, set your tee times. And that's about it. Okay, nice report, Ted, thank you. Any questions for Ted? Dale? I don't have a question, I have a statement to make. The shirt that I'm wearing, I purchased at the golf shop. So uh, I encourage people to go to the golf shop. There's wonderful, wonderful items there. Dale, we appreciate that, and you look good on camera. Thank you. <laughs> With that, uh, we're going to take a five-minute break. We'll come back at 1036. Thank you. Okay, let's get uh, restarted here. And we'll go with the board committee reports. Let's see. We don't have a quorum right now, so I guess we should wait. Is that correct? So Mary is on her way back. Okay. Well, we're going to wait for Mary, and she is here. So let's go ahead with compensation committee uh, meeting. Uh, Kathleen? Uh, hello, everyone. So this Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, the compensation um, report for June 2021. Uh, first, the committee discussed the possibilities for the base wage increase. We discussed the consumer price index, urban, the CPIU, which is the uh, additional price of goods uh, for the 12 months, and the employment cost index, the ECI, which is an increase to the wage index. The committee has used the CPIU for several years, except for the last year where there was no incre where no increase was improved. The current CPIU is 3.8. Um, a base wage impool using the CPIU at 3.8 percent equals five million, approximately five million nine hundred and eighty thousand. Our um, HR manager, Eric Wong, analyzed eight positions to determine if a zero base wage increase uh, for this year, 2021, uh, has impacted employee wages in relation to the market. His findings reported that overall, the market had not changed in relation to the salaries in Rossmore for the last 12 months. The committee recommends to the board that it use the CPIU of 1.8 for the 2022 budget. 3.8. 3. 3. 3. Uh, the merit market uh, pool wage is used in an employee performance and merit recognition and also used as a catch-up pool for wages that may fall below um, the uh, raising salary bands. The committee is recommending a merit pool in the amount of 75,000, which is the same amount approved for the 2020 wages uh, uh, prior to the usual considerations, unusual uh, considerations given for the 2021 pool uh, uh, because of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, 
So are you ready for a motion? I Any questions first? Okay, no discussion, uh, no questions for Kathleen at this point. I guess we'll move to a motion, right? Yep. So I make a motion that the board approve using 3.8% for the base wage increase. I'll okay. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? So I'd like to point out that <clears throat> there's something called base effect which talks about um, comparing one year to another. And we're comparing a, a base to a low base in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, so April to April, uh, 3.8 might be considered high because of that low base. However, when you look at zero uh, increase uh, for staff uh, for 2021, uh, that mitigates some of that low base effect. Uh, secondly, if any of you have followed the city of Walnut Creek, uh, they just uh, implemented a 2.5% increase for their employees uh, beginning today, actually, <laughs> uh, so for the remainder of the year. So uh, if there is concern that 3.8 sounds a little bit high due to that uh, base effect, uh, I think it's, uh, there's catch-up involved uh, to get our employees uh, competitive in the marketplace, and we value our employees and want to um, keep them. So that's just my comment. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments or discussion? All right, I think we're ready for a vote, Deborah. Walker? Yes. Stumfeld? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Unanimous. And you have another motion. I do. So I also make a motion that the board approve using a merit market pool of 75,000. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Mary. Discussion. I think that warrants some explanation of what that is. Somebody wanna tackle that? Sure. So um, the merit market pool, so we have bands uh, for any position uh, of uh, uh, salary bands, which mean that someone uh, will at least get um, um, a range of below and above the median of that position uh, in the general area of the, um, that we live in for that position. And um, sometimes people have dropped below because the band moves up. And um, so they are below that uh, range that we have determined for their salary band. And so this pool is used to catch them up so that their salary is within our bands. It's also used for merit uh, performance. Um, and the, the uh, employees are all rated by the manager. And so the high performers or someone who has done a special project would be eligible for a merit increase or a lump sum increase. Uh, and a lump sum increase is also used if you are at the top of your band, um, then you would not get a salary increase, but you uh, would be eligible if you performed well for a, um, a lump sum. Uh, does, it, does that sound clear? Any questions? If I could just add, that there is a comprehensive compensation management system uh, used uh, here, uh, overseen by Eric Wong, and, um, and the compensation committee is certainly a part of that, and it works extremely well to retain uh, and reward uh, employees. Any other discussion? All right, I think we're ready for a vote. Deborah. Walker? Yes. Stumfell? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Kathleen? That's all. All right, thank you very much. On to the planning committee, Leanne Hamaji. Yes, the uh, report in your packet is true and accurate. Um, there's no pending decisions at this time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any comments or questions for Leanne? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, 
Leanne, you're moving fast on me. Policy, <laughs> uh, Dale Harrington. Yes, uh, boy, we had a had a, a, an agenda-filled meeting. Um, there were four policies for us to address, but uh, first off, what we did is that uh, Neva Flaherty was elected vice chair of the policy committee for this year. Um, the, the first policy was consider revising policy 601.2 Ross Moore News editorial policy. And this policy has generated a lot of interest by the community. And so following deliberation, the committee agreed it would individually, in other words, each member of the committee, propose revisions to the policy and submit them to Mr. O'Keefe or Ms. Ms. Rose before June 30, and that the revisions would be reviewed at our July meeting. So if you're interested in learning about that, uh, please attend the uh, July policy committee meeting. The uh, second one is uh, consider creating a new policy or revised policy 501.0, installation of signs on Golden Rain Foundation property. And this also has generated a lot of input from the community. A motion was made, seconded, and carried that the committee add a new number to the policy 501.0 stating that any new or past trail naming will be done by the Trails Club in conjunction with the landscape manager's approval. The, th the next one was uh, review new policy 201.7, resident committee term limits, referred back to the policy committee for further consideration. So it had been to the board before and was sent back to our committee. So I uh, asked that uh, Ms. Stumpful, um, seated over here to my right, um, rewrite the policy to include her revisions and to submit her proposed revisions for review at the committee's next meeting in July. So that'll be another one we'll be reviewing. And then the last item, folks, is review policy 102.1.4, resident committee term limits, referred back, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize, uh, 102.1.4, membership transfer fee to define a response period parameter for the inheritance held for resale. In other words, when a resident um, may lives here, uh, owns a manor and may pass, then their manor is, can be inherited uh, by, by someone. So a motion was made, seconded, and approved to recommend to the board that it approve the proposed revisions in section 4B of that policy. And everyone here has a, has a, a, a copy of that, I believe. But um, the revision was just to add a, a, a word, the word uh, either. So on the first line of 4B, it says, within one year of the latter to occur of either the effective date of title transfer. That's the end of my report, sir. Any questions for Dale? Kathleen. Uh, yes, after the first reading of policy 102.1.4, uh, I would like to consider uh, an additional change to 
uh, the exceptions, which is C7 for the non-natural person, and so I'd like to refer it back to the committee. Okay, so referred back to the committee, Re requires no motion that I'm aware of. No, thank you. no motion. Okay, anything yeah. else for policy? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> there is uh, no unfinished business and now we're on to new business, uh, an update uh, from Brizak and Associates on the satellite wastewater recycle facility. And we suddenly have a lot of noise here. Oh, the screen is coming down, that's why. <laughs> uh, and Jim. Uh, <laughs> And Jim, uh, th this screen is uh, also, it's also for your presentation, but there is a movie at one o'clock. Oh. And so uh, some attendees might start coming in around noon. So we just wanna be mindful of our time uh, that uh, we have a little over an hour, but I, I, I'm not envisioning you'll require more than that. Is that correct? No, and I'm disappointed because I thought you were inviting me to go to the movie with you. Well, <laughs> you, you are so invited, you may stay. Tim had a comment, sorry. Yeah, so let me just introduce yes. Jim. Uh, Jeff Matheson is not here. He's on a well-deserved vacation. So um, Jim Brizak from Brizak and Associates, they have been consulting with the board of directors for the last couple of years on water reclamation for the Rushmore community. The, um, they prepared a feasibility study. Uh, I think it's been more than a year since that document was done. And then um, it's time now for an update to you as to the results of the testing and um, additional recommendations they have around the site locations where a facility might go, some updates on the cost and so on. But let me just back up for just a moment to explain why re water reclamation, why this is even being discussed because we have a number of new board members here and I'm sure other residents haven't been um, dialed into this yet. So uh, in the last drought, which ended in, in the spring of 2017, we had significant water restrictions. So as a golf course operator, golf courses were mandated by the state of California to reduce their water consumption by 40%. In addition, cities, municipalities, counties, so public, publicly owned street medians had to turn off their water completely. They, so they had a 100% reduction in their water. Our medians inside the gate are owned by us. They're not publicly owned medians. That is why they are still green. That's why they, we didn't turn the water off there. The board decided that they didn't want to. They wanted to, as long as we could, to continue to water them. The state did not mandate that private property owners reduce their water consumption, but the state did require uh, or recommend, I should say, a 20% reduction in residential consumption. That was back in 2017, 2016 and 17. And then as you probably remember, water rates were increasing. There was a surcharge that the East Bay Mud had on, on our water. It was a 20% surcharge. In addition, they had successive 9% annual increases for several years in a row. Um, even right now, I think that they are a 6% increase. Is that 4% 4, 4 increase is the current mandate, but it's likely inevitable with the current water situation and the pending drought, or, and some would say we're already in the drought, that there's gonna be significant increases in, in water rates around the corner. So having green golf courses is important, certainly for the golfers. The golfing community want it, they wanna keep playing golf, whether there's a drought or not. So it would, uh, some residents have expressed concern that, hey, why, is, why do the golfers get that kind of level of attention? Why do they, why is GRF continuing to irrigate golf courses during a drought? And, but I will tell you that the discussion that a previous board had around this issue was that having green golf courses is great for the golfers, but it benefits virtually every home in Rossmore to have that green open space. It's part of the aesthetic value of this valley. So aesthetically, whether you golf or not, every home, the realtors tell me that every home in Rossmore gets an economic benefit as a result of having green golf courses. But I will say, and if your home is on the golf course, of course you wanna be able to look out to green space whether you golf or not. You bought your home, you paid a premium to live on a golf course because it's serene, it's beautiful, it's quiet. All of those are the aesthetic values to, to having green golf courses. But I will argue, and I, as I have here before, that I think that the most significant value of having green golf courses is that it is the fire break for the valley. 
The fire marshal had told us in 2018, uh, this is right after the drought had ended, he said that having that green space is critical to preventing a wildfire from sweeping through Rossmore. And then that was, uh, he didn't predict it, but just a short while later, then Paradise happened and the Paradise Fire, which wiped out the town of Paradise. They didn't have a golf course. They don't have one bisecting their valley. We, we do. So hopefully we never are faced with a situation like that, but there are images that you can look up online right now. And you just, if you just Google uh, wildfire and golf courses and then pull up the images that come up when you do a search like that, you will find wildfire coming right to the edge of a golf course and stopping. The homes on the other side are not touched. So, so because green grass doesn't burn. So that is what has driven the board's decisions, at least up to this point, on water reclamation, why water reclamation is important for the golfers, for the aesthetic value, but probably critically and most importantly as the fire break for the valley. Whether it, it breaks the fire or whether it is a staging or triage area for the emergency responders or people, the evacuees, likely that's where people will go because it will not burn there. It will be smoky if there was a fire, but it's not gonna burn right there. So that probably is the single most important reason, and I would argue, to have irrigated golf courses. Now, I will say that I have seen communities where um, golf went out of business or uh, you know, the golf operators shut down. And I've seen that in master plan communities. I've seen it in non-planned communities where uh, you have a brown golf course, it's now dead. It's not fun if you, to have a dead golf course because that is what will happen if we have a prolonged drought. Eventually, they, the state will mandate turning off all water on golf courses. That, that's inevitable. They had said in 2017, had the drought not ended, that was going to be one of the recommendations that was gonna be coming down the line, is that if the drought continued beyond April of 2017, it was likely that the state was gonna be mandating shutting off all water in parks and golf courses and cemeteries. So it, it's not a question of if, it's really a question of when. And are we gonna be prepared? Is water reclamation that important to you to keep up your property values, to have provided um, a recreational amenity for the golfers and for, uh, as a fire break and an evacu potentially an evacuation zone for emergency response? So that's kind of setting the stage for Jim and the work that he's done. So he's done this feasibility study to get you to this stage where you can evaluate whether or not uh, water reclamation makes sense. I will say that as, we, as he pointed out and as the board had directed, water reclamation for GRF is focused around the golf courses. We did explore at one point whether that water, the reclaimed water could be sold or distributed to the mutuals. There isn't enough sewage rec reclaimed water to distribute to the mutuals and the piping cost to, to dig up streets and drive, you know, reclaimed water to other parts of the community would just be prohibitively expensive. This project by itself will be prohibitively expensive, but it's really, you're looking at the, in the crystal ball for your long-term future. What is this gonna look like five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line? Is climate change with us? Is it a real thing? Is, is these temperatures and wildfires, are these gonna be a fact of life for us in the future? That's part of what your assessment uh, and determination of whether this project should go forward is, is really ultimately up to you guys as the board of directors. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, good morning to you and thanking, uh, thank you for having us back again uh, to discuss the feasibility study report. You should have in your packets a tech memo, which is a summation and provides some of the updates that have been made uh, as time has gone on. Um, my name's Jim Brzezek, and I'm pleased to be the manager of this project uh, for you. And with me this morning is uh, Christy Robinson, our senior environmental planner, and should be joining by Zoom, if the technology is working right, is Dr. Dennis Casper, our senior process engineer. Are you with us, Dennis? Yes, I am. Thank you, sir. Now I just have to master the technology. Our agenda. Uh, our agenda this morning has been developed to provide you with updates from our ongoing investigation and the coordination that we've been completing with GRF. 
We're going to review components of the proposed project and provide to you our recommendations. Uh, we'll present updated project cost estimates, and then we can answer questions. Use of recycled water in California is widespread. It's effective, it's cost effective, and it's safe for a variety of uses. Uh, GRF and the Rossmore community are both part of an overwhelming movement to save potable water by developing new supplies of recycled water. We think it's so important we put it on our logo. Um, so what is recycled water? Recycled water is the application of science and engineering in ways that can be used to cleanse wastewater, taking it from sanitary sewers as sewage that we're familiar with and converting it by treatment so that it can be safe and effective for non-potable uses, including irrigation of golf courses and landscapes. Now, there are other types of projects that do both direct and indirect potable reuse of, of recycled water, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking, as Tim was saying, for the irrigation of golf courses, medians, landscapes. That's the project that we're keying into. And in fact, those other larger projects which are doing work uh, for indirect and direct potable reuse are starting to come into, I won't say conflict, it's too strong of a word, but competition for who's going to have the rights of the wastewater to do the cleansing and creating of recycled water. So we now have potable water and we now have sources of alternative water supply. And it's, well, California is all about arguing over water anyway, so it fits in perfectly. Um, California generated about 218 billion gallons of recycled water per year. Um, that's a lot of recycled water. Approximately 60% of that is used for projects just like yours, for the irrigation of golf courses, landscapes, and agriculture. Our guidance uh, to develop recycled water are the following five purposes that you'll find in our project report. We want to reduce the purchase of potable water from East Bay mud. It's costly, and it's not the highest and best use of, re of potable water. Potable water should be for drinking, recycled water, and non-potable water more appropriately used for irrigation purposes. Um, we want to produce a resilient, feasible alternative water supply by recycling locally Rossmore's wastewater. I'm going to define a term a couple of times. I'll, I'll hammer away at it, but it's satellite water recycling facility. Um, it's all, we call it a swerf, but it's the definition of using that recycled, creating it locally and using it locally. Uh, the treatment plant that Central Sand has about 17 miles away in Martinez is a regional facility. Everything flows towards that one point of treatment and then reuse and or discharge. Um, this is a different concept, a satellite facility which is constructed, designed, and planned for the local use, not to export it out somewhere else, um, and to treat what is available to us economically that's local to us. So that's an important distinction to make. We're gonna develop and maintain a f an effective or contribute to an effective fire break. It's not a silver bullet, but it requires fuel management as well is another very important aspect. But as Tim was saying, when you have a well properly irrigated turf, which is, exists currently in the golf course, that can be an effective portion of a fire break and stopping the spread of wildfires. Wildfires, everybody is concerned with that. Um, we want to minimize the use of potable water uh, and, and make sure that we're maximizing its use uh, for other water supplies to replace potable water with recycled water for irrigation. As the project progressed forward, um, GRF tasked us to find answers to the following key questions. Will East Bay Mud provide a potable water backup supply for irrigation of the project if the project's offline or if the project is incapable for any other reason to support an irrigation supply? And the answer to that question about East Bay Mud supporting is yes. Um, as long as we're not in a restrictive drought mode, uh, where they're not allowing potable water to be used for any irrigation purposes. But in general, they're not going to come back in and replace our meter. They're not going to change out the pipes. The physical infrastructure will remain as it is, and we would be free to continue to use that water as we have been. 
except to the extent that if we're identified as using potable and we want to put it on the golf course, that's where they're going to treat us the way they've been treating us up to now. The next question was, is there a supply of wastewater available to GRF in a sufficient quantity, key aspect of any of these projects, that we could uh, replace a portion of potable water for irrigation at the golf course? And again here, the answer is yes. Uh, we conducted four separate rounds of wastewater flow monitoring. You probably saw them in the streets with their van and their gear and their tripods entering the manholes and setting the equipment to measure the flow. We did that four times because through the years we want to make sure we have the historical backup and consistency in the way that we're understanding the characteristic of production of raw wastewater. It's really important to that end. Um, the community produces an average of 0.44 MGD, 440,000 gallons per day, and this can be expended, um, used uh, to tap into two additional sewer sheds that are not a part of the project we're talking. Earlier, the first report we did, we saw there's three separate sewer sheds, and we could figuratively tap into each of those. What I'm presenting to you today leaves two of those sewer sheds as backup and focuses on the primary sewer shed that, that produces about 0.4 MGD. The last of these three questions uh, that were asked of us is, can the proposed SWERF satellite project produce uh, at, at a price that's comparable to the cost of water that's purchased from East Bay Mud? And the answer to that, again, is yes. A comparison of estimated and budgeted operational costs is ongoing. Working with Jeff Matheson, he's responsible for taking our numbers and putting them into context with the budget that's already been, that's being planned for the use of recycled water. And yeah, we do have a comparison that's favorable in terms of looking at the operational and the annual costs, and we'll go into those in just a moment. So the water supplies and the way um, irrigation demand occurs is that there's a demand during the maximum month, the peak month, which is July, uh, of about 0.54 million gallons per day. That's how much of a demand is out there. And GRF uh, has used water from East Bay Mud in the form of potable water purchases. It's gotten water from Tice Creek. And it's gotten water from an unusual source uh, that we do have several air conditioners that are using water cooling. And so they discharge about 110,000 gallons per day. And we, GRF has been capturing that as a part of, part of your water supply portfolio and using that uh, on, on the irrigation of the golf courses. So the common thread, though, between these three sources of water is that they all respond to environmental conditions. So in a drought, uh, East Bay mud could restrict water available. The AC discharge will eventually be phased out, uh, but the hotter it is outside, the more we crank the AC units up. Uh, and then Tice Valley Creek is, is a great supply, one which you're in the process of securing your rights to use um, that water. Um, but Tice Valley Creek also responds to environmental conditions, extreme dry, uh, periods of drought, lack of rainfall, the water in the creek goes down and it's no longer uh, able to be extracted for use. So we just have to take this water supply portfolio into consideration and understand what's left, what's coming down the road. And we see that the 0.25 million gallons from East Bay Mud would be replaced with recycled water minimally. And then the decision would be made as to when and whether or not to use the air conditioning discharges um, if we replace that, then the, the demand at the treatment plant goes up to 0.36 MGD. I'm going to cover these same numbers a, a couple of times over until they become a little bit more familiar for everyone. The project that we're recommending, um, the site has to be determined for the diversion of wastewater. Um, we have focused in on the guard gate in Rossmore Parkway as being an optimum location. The majority of all of the of wastewater coming through uh, and, and out into Tice Valley Boulevard uh, comes through this point. Uh, I had mentioned the number, 0.44 uh, million gallons a day uh, flow th underneath the guard shack. And we feel that that is closely related in distance uh, to the places that we're going to talk about for the treatment plant 
It works very well in terms of it's not all the way down at Tice Creek. Uh, I'm sorry, at Tice Boulevard. It's close enough that we can have a shorter pipeline and bring the wastewater back to a treatment plant location. Uh, a satellite recycled facility is recommended to be constructed either at the entryway, which is about the, to the community, about the intersection of Golden Rain Road uh, with uh, Rossmore Parkway. We call this our site number two. Um, I'm sorry, that's site number one, uh, manhole location number one. A satellite facility is recommended to be constructed at either the entryway or at the existing golf course maintenance building. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that. I believe it's by hole number nine. The point is you probably don't see it because it's got its own wall around, you know, for privacy and for security. So it's one of those out of sight facility locations. We think it were, would work well as a part of this project to put the reclamation facility within those walls. Um, the additional third component that we need are pipelines. We need pipelines that would initially divert wastewater out of the sewer. We need pipelines that would take the product water from the treatment and put it into the pond. And then we need a waste pipeline because these projects do produce a minimum about 10% of, of wastewater that can't be further recovered. And so we want to bring that into uh, the sewer, re reintroduce it to the sewer just below the point of diversion. So the basic project components then leave us with a wastewater diversion structure, a satellite recycling facility, and a series of three different pipelines that interconnect the system together. I just wanted to go over very briefly that in terms of what we've been doing on the project, uh, we began with an opportunity and constraints analysis. We conducted and prepared a feasibility study report. That report was later updated to meet some changing conditions, mostly the availability of riparian water and the reduction of the um, uh, amount of recycle that would be produced. Um, we issued technical memoranda on a variety of topics for irrigation demand, the availability of wastewater. We did the four rounds of wastewater flow monitoring. Um, we did develop planning values for a satellite facility, and we developed um, a concept layout for a wastewater diversion system. So I promised to return to this awkward word, what we call SWERF. Uh, satellite water recycling facility, as we abbreviate it. And again, it is a local, not a regional result or project. It, it's in your backyard to meet your backyard needs. It's sized to meet specific demands. It processes only the liquid phase. There is a solid phase of wastewater treatment um, that will not be treated. Uh, here at the plant. There's an inorganic portion at the headworks of the facility, which would be bagged and uh, hauled away for off-site uh, uh, treatment. Um, but that's the most odorous part of the treatment system, and we're not dealing with that here. So that helps in terms of making the facility more consumer friendly. Uh, and then there's a portion of this, those solids that are also returned to the sewer. So we really have two solids uh, being generated by the plant, um, neither of them being treated here. I wanted to share with you some images uh, that result from the planning that's occurred over the years. Uh, these are done by design build teams that we've worked with. They have significant expertise that's been developed to blend these facilities into their environment. Swerfs can be constructed and operated in ways that conceal their existence from the public and that hide the inner mechanical operations that are going on if you choose to put it in a building or lower it in terms of, of making an excavation and lowering the profile of it. Um, all of these are renderings by companies with whom we've worked before, and they represent examples of what can be done. Some of them, actually, I, I usually look at them and say, don't make them look so nice. They look better than my house. They look like they've come out in Sunset Magazine. The point that the architects and the engineering teams uh, and the artists that work on these is all about compatibility to the landscape. We don't really want to hear or see uh, these facilities, unless we're taking a tour of them for technical purposes. Um, but in general, they should go away. They should, and, and that's why there's a potential to site the facility at the entryway. Without this kind of a treatment, 
we wouldn't want to put it as our grand entrance to the community. And so just in the way that if you've been to Palm Springs or Coachella Valley and you see those quite large subdivisions with uh, fountains in their entryway, that's the other extreme. We can find a happy medium where uh, architectural treatments and renderings can be applied uh, so that we get facilities that we're proud of in terms of their, in terms of their aesthetic values. So what's going on inside of these plants? Um, this is what's called a pre-engineered or a package treatment plant. It's made by the firm called Ovivo. And it starts to give you an idea of the processes that are uh, being developed and deployed. Um, everything is sitting there on top of a large vault, which is an aerated chamber, uh, which provides the primary contact time with the bugs that actually eat the waste. Um, the facility, this is a membrane bioreactor, uses membrane filtration. There are a lot of different types of technologies that we can put into the box. Um, we've selected what we think is the most economical approach for the project. It uses this type of a package system mentality to produce recycled water. Now the production and use of recycled water is still regulated by the state. So we have to work closely with the regulatory agencies to make sure that what we prepare and provide to them meets their requirements. There's state law that is very specific in terms of the parameters of the water quality that have to be produced in order to use it effectively. Um, so going back to site two, if we put this mechanical package inside mm -hmm. one of these types of structures, we might have something that fits. One of our recommendations for moving forward on this is to have a charrette with the board, a planning opportunity to go walk the sites and talk about pluses and minuses of the look and the feel and the requirements. The other benefit when we put uh, the mechanical uh, into these package, into the interior building, we can better control airflow and the re potential release of odors. And so that's a help as well overall to the project planning. Now this used to be my funny slide within the stack. Um, it's good to know that, that the project on its own could generate about 1.8 billion gallons of water. Uh, what I like to focus on here is, you know, welcome to California, bring your own water. Well, that's what this project does. This project says we've got an area that we want to irrigate. Let's make our own water. Um, this used to be a lot funnier and now it's just expected. It makes a lot of sense. Let's shrink our water footprint by conserving as much as we can, but where we have to apply water, let's do it with the correct water supply source, in this case, recycled water. So project updates. Um, we've revised our irrigation demand and uh, we feel that the facility can be constructed in two separate stages. Uh, in the first stage, it would be the replacement of the East Bay mud uh, purchase water at about 0.25 MGD. Whether or not or when the air conditioning units that are water cooled come online, it would become a phase two decision as to whether or not you wanted to populate that mechanical structure with an additional 0.11 million gallon per day treatment capacity. If you did, you'd now have a facility at 0.36 MGD. And all I'm doing is taking the East Bay mud 0.25 and adding the discharge that we use from the uh, cooling systems. And that gives us our maximum uh, project sizing. Um, the updates included additional flow monitoring. Uh, we created a hydraulic model for facility sizing and cost estimating that linked all the pipelines together and analyzed uh, the pumping requirements and the horsepower requirements and the energy use. Uh, we met quite a bit a uh, few times with vendors of Ovivo and others uh, and uh, met with construction contractors and got from them better on the ground numbers for installation of pipelines, uh, closer sizing of the wastewater treatment facilities themselves. Um, we looked at an expanded number of diversion structures because now we had this tool uh, to model the wastewater flow from the point of diversion to the point of use. And so we were able to then dial in uh, a little bit closer on the pipeline costs and the, their diameters. And we did some additional coordination with Central Contra Costa Sanitary District, with the City of Walnut Creek, and with East Bay Mud. 
We're currently and actively in development of a memorandum of understanding so that this team of agencies can support one another and understand the project and our needs for environmental compliance, regulatory compliance, permits. And so these are our partners within the project. They're very important to the team uh, and our coordination with them is, um, has been very helpful. Uh, and there are still some outstanding. We don't have the final MOU yet, but we expect uh, we expect that to bring that back to you shortly. So we talked about flow monitoring locations, and here in green you can see um, three of the locations where flow monitoring was completed. Um, manhole 27.4 is across from the fire station. So as you exit next time uh, on Rossmore Parkway, the fire station will be to your left. Across the street to your right is manhole 27.4. This manhole is important because it was used by Central Sand when they updated their system-wide uh, um, wastewater master plan report. And so we wanted to tag into that because it's a data point that exists, so we did additional monitoring in that location, and the numbers came out fairly well. Um, at the security gate, this is manhole number one, and again, it's just downstream or heading towards, as, as you're exiting the community again, um, it's off to your left, just, just below the guard gate. Uh, we like that location for a number of reasons. First of all, we have a convergence of the existing pipelines that come together, and everything that flows out goes underneath the guard gate, 0.44 MGD. Um, we also like it because it's a manned facility. There's people there 24-7. So if a red light went on that said we have a pumping issue uh, or some you know, potential for, the, for upset, uh, in the diversion, um, we, we would know so immediately. It would already be hooked up to the appropriate SCADA systems and we get off-site management with a beeper that would let them know that that was going on. Uh, but it's just good to have personnel around. Um, things can happen with any type of mechanical or electrical, so there's a backup and we like that. Um, the third one is MH3, which is uh, manhole three, which is just shy of the uh, intersection of Golden Raiden Road and Rossmore Parkway. These are the stable of uh, flow monitoring locations that we used reliably throughout the program. This, what we're looking at here is the diurnal flow curve. This is the way that water is discharged past and through manhole one. Um, we gathered wastewater monitoring data to understand the timing of the wastewater that was available to the project. That's a really important concept and making sure that flows are diverted maximally so that they're available at the treatment plant for conversion to recycled water. Uh, the nature of all of the wastewater flowing is that it generally follows a two peak per day. Uh, and you can see that um, around 9 o'clock and then around uh, 9 p.m. and around 7 a.m. Those peaks uh, are called the diurnal curves, and they're just characteristic of a residential uh, wastewater flow. But again, they give us a little bit more information that helps to understand the sizing of facilities. So then we needed a site for the SWERF, for the Satellite Water Recycling Facility. And initially, when we started the project several years ago, there was a, um, I'm thinking it was eight or nine sites were initially developed um, by really GRF. And so we toured those sites and we did some opportunities, pluses and minuses on each. Um, right now, this, let me just point them out. Um, site number five is at the maintenance facility, as I mentioned before. It is on the other side of Tice Creek and it is further away from the guard gate that we would like. Uh, site number two is at the entryway to the community, uh, off to the right. Unfortunately, it's in the footprint or actually pretty close proximity to what has been described as the last remaining golden rain tree on the, in the community. So we'd want to take special measures, maybe move that tree or plant some additional trees or somehow avoid any kind of a, an overlap with them. Um, and at site two, uh, we think that a building would be the best way to go, best way to hide it architecturally and, and, and for the other reasons operationally. Um, site five at the maintenance building requires additional wastewater pumping. It's further away 
Well, I said before, we've got to dispose of our waste. So if we're taking water out of the system at the guard gate, I'm probably down about here, we have to go a little bit beyond that for the wastewater. That is made a little bit worse from site five at the golf course maintenance facility. So for those reasons, that's why we like site two at the entryway. It's not the furthest treatment plant away. It's not the furthest from the point of diversion. It provides a good median and it, it, it helps operationally to have things a little bit closer as well. This is just a recap of the flow monitoring that was done. Again, you can recognize the manhole numbers now, 24-7, manhole one, uh, manhole 24, manhole three, uh, and the flows that they represent. Again, seeing the highest flow at manhole one location of about 0.44 MGD. So we start to get into costs and cost estimating. Overall, the diversion system, product water, and the waste pipelines are estimated to be between 986,000 and $1.3 million. And that's for the diversion, well, the Swerf site two at entryway, and um, it considers taking wastewater out of uh, diversion point one, manhole one. Um, we moved upstream, shortened the pipeline routes. We favored the routes uh, for construction through turf because it's a lot less costly if we're not opening up streets with asphalt and striping uh, and getting rights of way or easements to be in those streets. Uh, so it's much more uh, compact of a project if we're going through turf. And we've proven on other projects that we can get in and out of that type of insulation without permanent damage to the golf course and without much loss in play. Um, certainly when these projects are being constructed, we have to deal with that. We need a plan to be in place as to how the construction activities are gonna come together. And we start to reflect that mostly when we begin talking about pipeline costs. The capital costs for the SWERF system are much more lengthy in terms of the numbers of the types of facilities that are incorporated and the costs for those. Uh, the total project costs are now estimated to be between nine and 9.3 million. And again, this is for uh, SWERF sites two and five respectively. So SWERF site two would be nine million. SWERF site five would be 9.3 million. Previously, before this update, we were at a, a project cost of 13.6 million. So you can see the more we investigate, the more we dial in, the more we develop infrastructure for the analysis of this project, we're able to get secure uh, new readings, reading the tea leaves someone had said earlier, about uh, the reduction in the cost. And that's what we're trying to do. Progressing the design development takes away some of the insecurities and unknowns on the cost. Our updated estimates, uh, are, these are from the diversion at Manhole 1 Guardhouse. About a 30% reduction uh, through the time that we've been working on the development of the tech memo and the issuance of the feasibility study report. Project capital cost summary. So the further investigation of capital costs, we think we're at 9.13 to 9.3 um, using the guard gate and swerf site to the entryway. That's what the project consists of at these two costs. We're still available to move these units around and respond to what the board wants to see. Um, that's why I suggested design charrette as a way of going out in the field uh, and better understanding uh, what would have to be done. The annual operating costs, that key measure that Jeffrey was using to develop to cost comparison with East Bay mud recycled, I'm sorry, East Bay mud potable water. Total annual operating costs are now estimated to be between $256,000 and $286,000. Again, SWERF sites at two and five respectively. And the previous O&M estimate was, for comparison was $464,000. So that's a great in decrease in the cost based on initial investi additional investigations. So what did we do in the technical memo? Just in summary, we updated the project cost estimates. We used advanced technological development and review, just modeling that's commonly available for pressurized pipes. 
Uh, we advanced the concepts. We considered planning, design, construction, and operational requirements, what we'd otherwise call soft costs, and we were able to dial those in a little bit better for their incorporation into the project. Fire breaks, um, plants that, you, that are low growing, that are open structured, that aren't as resinous, resonant, full of resin as other plants, large open areas, all these things contribute to pointing in the direction of a fire break. Whether that fire break is irrigated or not, uh, either creates fuel load or it doesn't. And so irrigating the golf course, maintaining distances and open spaces, replanting with more, uh, less resonance, less, less uh, vegetation prone to fire, these are all good things from a master planning perspective uh, that the golf course should take into consideration whenever it's removing trees or adding new trees or vegetation in general or even in the selection of turf types. Um, you've got it set up really well. Tim, you went through all of the good points about it and we think, we agree that uh, golf courses can perform well in assisting fire breaks to occur. So at this point, with the team's assistance, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Leanne? In your um, visibility study, you had mentioned other sites that you were considering, and one of them was uh, above Cactus Court. Site number six, yes. Okay, which seems like it serves similar benefits as site two in its location. And I just wondered why that wasn't in your technical memo. Um, we had dropped and focused in as we went from the feasibility study to the revision of the feasibility study to the tech memo. We just agreed that rather than cost estimating a whole series, let's just pick the ones we like the best. The problem with Site 6, unfortunately, is that we, when you stand at the roadside, there's a really nice interactive um, uh, placard and identification of uh, Native American uh, use of that site. And that, I, it's possible to do some an initial coordination with the representatives of the heritage folks that come in and can decide on that. We saw it as <clears throat> almost a deal breaker. And, and so that's the reason why we didn't put site six in the top three sites. <clears throat> Other questions for Jim? Kathleen. You mentioned somewhere in here um, uh, uh, the possible smell, and um, I know this is something that uh, residents <clears throat> will be really concerned about. Can you talk about that? So we're dealing with raw wastewater, and we're pumping raw wastewater and treating raw wastewater, and we can't hide the fact completely that it is raw wastewater. There's an odor to it. Um, some people detect it as a musty odor, um, some people don't smell it at all, and they may be standing right near it. We've successfully deployed um, different types of odor control. There are soil beds that can be used. They're a fairly passive system uh, where uh, air handling units are brought in uh, to place, be placed underground, kind of like a septic system in re or a leach field in reverse, and to blow air uh, underneath the turf, and that uh, gets microorganisms active that would otherwise expel uh, odorous uh, od uh, hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, there are other systems as well, carbon systems, um, and probably more than what my experience has provided, but they're in their, each in their category are able to contribute to reducing or eliminating off-site odors. And, you know, the, um, the real judge of that is, is your own nose, as you said. And that's another reason why setting up appointments and going out and seeing similar facilities. Um, we had some board members from Diablo Country Club a couple of years back. We went on top of that mechanical system and we were opening the plates up and nobody could smell it. So we were literally standing on the top of the facility where you'd expect the most. Uh, the facility we did at Pacific Grove, <clears throat> we had a lot of dilu dilution because of uh, onshore breezes coming off of the ocean. But similarly, at both the diversion point and at the headworks of the treatment plant, odors were effectively controlled. 
Uh, yeah, we had talked before the shutdown uh, of taking a tour uh, of some facilities, so I would be uh, very interested in that. And then also, um, to, you know, if there is some odor that some sensitive people would detect, uh, would the site near the maintenance be a better option for that for that reason? You know, I I, I don't know. Um, the answer to your question. I, I, I think what's important is the management of the odor uh, and then the use of technology to, to treat. Then we're in something that's, that's predictable. Um, that, that's sort of a weak answer to your question, though. Dale? I have two questions. Does it ever occur where you might need to use more than 10% of the water to move the waste along to Martinez, for instance? I'm sure it does on a daily basis, but the, there, that could be overcome uh, with a little bit of on-site storage and the metering of the waste material. We call it WAS, Waste Activated Solids. Uh, that could be moved and pumped. It'll have to be pumped down. Um, so you're asking, do we ever come off of a 10% wasting rate? Right. Yes, um, but it's specific. Dennis, do you want to do you want to chime in on this on, on variations in WAS production? Yes, I will. I presume you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're typically the type of biological system that is being recommended wastes between three and five percent of the total production that uh, is generated. We've used a 10% number. The flow we control, when we want to discharge it, we can do it at a couple hundred gallons a minute. We don't just bleed it slowly throughout 24 hours. We control it. So we discharge. We're, lo we're losing you, Dennis. That's unfortunate. But yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think he was also going to go into alternative uh, treatment methods. There are different types of membrane products. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that the Headworks, which is the place where grit and uh, inorganic material, rocks, pebbles, that's collected right. through the street, that gets removed way up front. Uh, because it tends to be odorous, we have an automatic washer on that system. So there's recycled water being applied to scrub it down. And then it goes into an automatic bagging system, and it produces about 40 pounds uh, per bag. And then they go, actually the bagging unit sits right within a, um, a disposal unit. The sanitary uh, 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 landfill driver comes over, grabs it, sticks it in the back like any other waste. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and my, my next question, my last question is, uh, if the board decides at some point to give you a go on this, how long might it take before it's operational? We like to allow about a two-year time frame, about a year in design, because we're doing the concept level design. We're not doing final design. Oh, okay. So the final design has to be done. Permits have to be issued. We allow eight to 12 months for that. And then the next phase is construction. Um, there are some activities. If uh, design build is used, if design build is a procurement methodology by which a designer teams up with a construction contract or under one contract, we can get a lot more speed and actually early start of different elements without all of the paperwork that would be otherwise necessary in separate design and build contracts. Thank you very much. Other questions, uh, Ted? At the collection point, uh, say near the guardhouse, either one, whichever, is, there, is this all done underground or is that an above ground structure that will be put over the, you know, where they pump it back? All below ground, um, it would look, unchanged with the potential exception of, a, of elect, an electrical box with a light on the top of it. Um, but you wouldn't see and hopefully we wouldn't otherwise detect the presence of, of the diversion. And if I may, 
the, the design of these systems on the diversion systems are passive, so that if there was a disruption, the wastewater that's currently flowing by gravity continues to flow by gravity. We only extract or divert what we need and pump that to the treatment plant when we need it as a part of our production schedule. And so a disruption at the diversion point would result in no change. Uh, we, the operator would still get a call because they're going to want to start it up in the morning, and if new flow isn't coming in, they want to know what's going on. Leanne and then Kathleen. Yeah, I have two questions also. Um, you mentioned that there were, well, in your feasibility study, you talked about other locations locally that have a facility. Um, I wondered if any of them had um, gone through a drought season and if they had to use East Bay mud as a backup and how that worked and was it a smooth backup or is it something we need to learn from and be wary of? I think there's, there's always goodness in being worried and uh, being aware. So I think your, your point is well taken. If we can find an analog, what, do, what can we learn from them? Um, there is a golf course in Alameda that Eve Spay Mud supplies recycled water to. So we can check in with them on that, maybe get a tour set up, or at least get a list of questions to them that go to the, the point that, that you're interested in. Okay. So th that's the one. Th there aren't very many right now that are active in development. There's Diablo Country Club, Moraga Country Club, Orinda. We've worked with them on different stages of planned development. But in terms of a constructed facility fed by East Bay, East Bay Mud as being the water purveyor in a drought, cutbacks, I think the Alameda Golf Course will be the one. Okay. And then also your, um, your um, rendering of the micro blocks, there wasn't any scale of size. So um, what dimensions are we talking about for that box? And then also the dimensions of the, or the perimeter size of the plant? Perfect question. Um, the woman from the news, Rossmore newspaper and I were chatting about this before. Um, it's about a 70 by 40, and that's an initial uh, by the vendor based on the information we've developed and provided to them. On top of that, we've allowed for a 10-foot perimeter button, uh, buffer on all sides. And what we've started talking to them about is reconfiguring if we can take individual processes like the headworks process from the, uh, uh, from the um, biological process, uh, from the disinfection process, if we could move them apart and treat them as pods, if you will, within a sizing that might shrink if we were able to do some maneuvering of the portions of the project. Kind of like taking the wheels off of the car and storing them separately in different locations and then getting up in the morning and putting them back on. Kathleen, and then Ted. Um, okay, so so following up on um, Leanne's question, um, the amount of wastewater coming into the treatment plant wouldn't really depend on a drought, right? Because this is water coming from people's houses. You'll see some reduction in it. The drought response will occur uh, typically interior use. Um, so the way this is that's what we care about: interior use of water to produce wastewater to produce recycled water. And so um, during the drought, people do it here, and there is even a downside to this, uh, and that is will we have enough wastewater being produced under a drought because people are cutting back on interior uses? Okay, so my, uh, my other question is, um, I understand this is a difficult question because there are so many variables that we won't know in the next uh, you know, years. Um, but can you give us any idea of a range or a clue of the payback time? This is uh, expensive. And um, so, but we will be reducing the amount of water we're purchasing. Right. And, and the hopes is that if we just reduce, uh, rather replace at the same cost or better, it'll, be, it'll work from a budgetary perspective for GRF. So we've seen in economic models that we've run, and we've had specialists working with us, uh, about a 19-year period until 
the costs are the same, that, there's an, that the cost of recycled for that project equate to the cost of potable. What that doesn't take into consideration is kind of an unfair balancing because you're always comparing a new system against an older system that's fully paid off and fully developed. So East Bay Mud's infrastructure you know, is, is completed to the doorstep and delivering water. We've got to build that all. So it's hard to make a fair comparison on that basis alone. Um, but we can make an attempt to look more specifically at cost comparison if, if directed so. Could I follow up on that, Kathleen? <clears throat> so help me understand that, Jim. So uh, current East Bay mud costs estimated at $250,000. Uh, operating costs, 286000 So that's more than we're spending in water. Right, right. And we have to spend $9.3 million in order to do that. Right. How, how is a payback calculated with those numbers? Yeah, the, well, the methodology that was that was calculated that occurs in the feasibility study report looks at the period by at which your costs for recycled water production are the same as the cost for weight, for your purchase of uh, potable water, and that turned out to be 19 years. So I don't know that we would really call it a payback period. It's sort of a you're underwater until the 19th year, and then your 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 head's above water. Your, your yeah. cost becomes I, I equal. The, I don't understand. I mean, there is, how, how is there a payback? Are you anticipating okay, significant not, increases in East Bay mud? Well, yes, yes. Costs? absolutely. Okay. And, and right now, you know, 4%, and they're also raising the, co the rate on wastewater, which leads me to believe we may be able to, if we reduce our wastewater flow, can we reduce our cost for wastewater as well? Um, but in terms of the water system, it's not really a, a payback as it just is a replacement. So I, I don't, if Dennis is on, he would probably do a much better job at, as explaining this than I can. Um, well, the major uh, purpose of this is so that we will have water um, right. for the golf course. Uh, so this is just a, another consideration. What, what you'll find in the feasibility study report are a list of non-monetary benefits uh, as well, um, the provision of an adequately irrigated fire break, um, you know, that, that's a positive. I don't know how to put a dollar figure on that. Um, it's an unknown in terms of the occurrence, but it's kind of like an insurance policy, if you will. Um, you know, the aesthetic quality of the community, um, having it irrigated. Uh, we saw down in Monterey County that if, the, if they couldn't find an alternative water supply source, and their costs for water are much higher, uh, and we can go into that if you like, but because um, the golf course would go under, it would be a brown patch, as you had said, if you decided to keep the, to bring, to resurrect the golf course, it would be millions in terms of re-turfing it. Um, so that's another way of looking at the costs. Uh, as a cost comparison to other projects and what they've gone through. I just want to reiterate that the payback is not a good term to use with this. Uh, your other terms are appropriate, insurance yes. and so on, because when we think about residents being impacted, the coupon's not going to go down because of this. In fact, in the current comparison, it may go up, but it, but it requires a capital investment right. that is like an insurance policy going forward for the community. One thing I'd like to amend to, to my former discussion on this was uh, housing will take advantage of the availability of a golf course gone brown. And so you'll get a, an irreplaceable, irrevocable action will be developed. You have to do something with the land. If it's fallow and it's brown and it's not supporting golf, inevitably in California, a proposal will be brought forward for homes. You have protection against that here. I don't know if it works the same way as it did in Pacific Grove, but there was great concern about housing and housing impacts that were not previously planned for, and that includes roadway and emergency services and everything else that goes along with it. The insulation that, that GRF has and Rossmore as a whole from spiraling building, out of control building, uh, may protect you from that. But it'll, it'll be harder and harder if you have an asset that's not in use, it's not returning anything. Somebody will say, well, why don't we build more units there? 
So it's an unintended negative consequence. Ted, you had a Jim, question. Jim, this is Dennis Casper. Let me just uh, add a little bit different perspective. You are correct in saying payback may not be the proper term. Uh, it's payback. What's the payback on a fire department? It's a little bit like that, that you have a service that you that provides much more than simply uh, a cost return. When Jim Brzezak mentioned 19 years, the number sometimes goes between 12 and 20 years, and it depends upon the rate of cost increase for your potable water. East Bay Mud has put out various projections and for some of the planning projections, the numbers as great as 10% per year for the future, in which case the, the lines cross over. And at the point that they cross over, their water becomes more, much more expensive than the reclaimed water, even with the capital recovery. So it's kind of apples and oranges as to uh, what is the payback on a fire department. And, and Dennis, I, I would have agreed that 10% would be the number to use uh, until two weeks ago we got the flyer notifying from East Bay Mud that it was going to be 4%, 4% water, 4% wastewater. And when we've met with and sat down with East Bay Mud representatives, they said you really should use 10%. I think they, they want a buffer, right? They want to lower expectations a little perhaps. Right. right. Ted, you had a question? I, I read the proposal and I didn't see, uh, it, basically just on the sites, but if you're zeroing into possibility of two sites, have you also looked at what would it be to put the building on site two? I believe that's the one near the gate. Um, with regards to the creek, that's there. It's a Is concern. It, We're less than 100 feet or so away from the creek at site number, at Swerve site two. Um, my recommendations for next steps, recommenda recommendation number two, is heavy coordination with the regulatory agencies. The regional board has had too much fun working out here for too long over issues on the creek, and we don't want to give them any reason to extend their stay. Um, they're good people, and they have good programs, um, but they're a little bit myopic. And so you know, the technology to have a safe and effective treatment plant within a 100-foot buffer of the drip line of the trees. I think their fish, state fish and wildlife regulates up to the, buff, uh, the drip line of the tree plus 50 feet, I believe, is the jurisdiction they're taking now. Is that about right? So we would, that's why I was saying maybe we can take components of the treatment train, the process, and move them around a little bit. What I'm implying is if we could do that to get away from the creek and outside of their authority, like a narrower, longer building, instead of the 40 by 70, it would be 20 by whatever? Mm -hmm. Exactly. We're starting to look at different configurations. If you're housing them completely, what would that look like? Uh, it, it doesn't have to be one, tri uh, one uh, rectangle sitting on the land. Okay. And I, had one, I have another question, too, um, because I know East Bay Mud has their own um, water reclamation. How would they feel when you take 4MGD away from them? Surprisingly good. Um, you know, they are the water purveyor, and as such, there's a thing called, um, uh, just flew out of my mind, um, Duplication of Services Act, Service Duplication Act. So we can't compete with them because they legally have the purveyorship of water. We met with them. They said no objections. We're happy to contribute. What they're really doing is allowing small projects like this one to come about, and it makes it that much easier when they have to go to regional solutions. They did other projects that are regional through the Bureau of Reclamation, require much more infrastructure. This project is very small. Uh, all that we really ultimately want from them is a policy that they would adopt to uh, opt out, allow us to opt out of the service duplication law, and then their assistance and collaboration in other approvals, like they're helping us now move the memorandum of understanding through all of the other parties of the agreement. So they're, they're being quite helpful. Okay. Other questions? Leanne. I believe it was in the um, 
the attachment on the feasibility study, they talked about the 19-year projection that spoke of management of the facility. Now, I'm new to GRF, so this may have changed, but are we still considering um, owning it outright versus uh, outsourcing the entire thing versus owning it and hiring management? I mean, is that still a possibility? It is, and, and I think my recommendation number four is to make a decision on the procurement methodology, whether we would use similar to your solar field, um, what would be described as a P3 or a public-private partnership. Um, there they, they call it, you know, paying for water as a service. And so an all-inclusive fee that included management, their own staff, all the chemicals, all the construction, you know, is still very much alive and forms a comparison to the more traditional way of obtaining your own financing. And correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't some of the costs of that, um, well, you gave cost, uh, benefits and downsides to those yes. relationships. And at some point, I might be forgetting, but it seemed like there was actually a cost benefit to the outsourcing versus owning, is that? There can be, and um, I, I think it's where you want to put the money, where you want to have the control. Um, I think P3s are a good thing, but who are we going to get locally? We're going to, we have to be concerned about operations. Operations requires certification. Certification requires labor, and that labor needs oversight. And we don't know of many other facilities like this where we would have the expertise in the labor pool available to kind of come by and make sure that our facility is being operated correctly. Because they'll, they'll take all the onus for any discrepancies in operation, any violations, but still the fact is it's on your property. And if there's a major disruption of it, was it operational? And so did we have the right people providing the oversight? Well, those people are a part of a workforce that is a project company. So there'd be a new company established called the GRF Recycled Water Inc. And they would show up at a meeting like this and come before you and say, we're submitting our budget for the next quarter, or here's the results of how much production we've had. The other thing they're going to want to do, though, is they're going to want to expand the facility because they now are in a position of making money off of sales, sales of recycled water. And so negotiated into the agreement would be the primacy that GRF would have, so the no cutbacks under any circumstances. But how far would they be willing to go and to whom would they serve and how would that affect the community? Those are things that we, they're, they're not deal breakers, they just need to be incorporated into the deal. So P3 still exists, it's still a good idea, it's just a matter of legally, can you do it? Do you want to do it? Uh, financially, does it make more sense for you or not? Ted? So, um, is, I didn't read this in the, in the paperwork that I was reading, but I was wondering, is this a fully automated system? I uh, built a house with an engineered septic system that I never touched. It had its own computer. It would mm -hmm. tell someone what is wrong with it, and then that person would show up and fix whatever's going to happen with it. Is this thing a fully automated system that, uh, that you have people who run it, but they don't have, you know, if something's going to go down, it tells it ahead of time and they can take care of any problems? Yes, and if I was from Ovivo or one of these companies that puts it together, this is the point at which I'd pull out my phone and say, see, I can operate all the pumps from here and the chemical addition, and look, I'm getting a warning that the turbidity is off. Those are great sales points. What they really mean to us is labor and the cost of labor. That's the highest cost that we have on our operations spreadsheet. And so what can we do to reduce the labor involvement? And automation is one of the key ways, becoming more and more available, more and more common. You did it at your house. We can certainly do it at a reclamation plant. There still is going to be the need for, I think we've um, identified it as 0.25 FTE, full-time equivalents. And the need there, part of it could be designed around, part of it is at the agencies, but we may be taking daily water quality samples and those have got to be preserved and go off to the lab. And this is just kind of one example at the surf, you know, skimming the surface of your question. But 
it needs the right people to take the right actions. I'm less worried about the disruption because typically the, the fault on disruption is shut it down. And so everything gets shut down. That's kind of easy as long as the right people are there for startup. So does that add? OK, thank you. OK, we need to start wrapping this up. Paul? Sorry. Um, you said something about a two-year process for the design build. Yes. Um, and you included in that uh, environmental reviews, permitting, and stuff like that, I think you said eight months. You know, are there any other permitting environmental reviews that need to happen before that process takes place? You know, uh, both of the sites are next to Tice Creek. And what kind of uh, barriers to progress are we going to see? Or maybe not barriers, but how long is that going to extend the process? It, it could take it all the way well through the end of the process, but we don't want that. We want early indication of favorable permit permittability. We need to sit down with the local representative of the Regional Water Con Quality Control Board, the Air Quality Management District, uh, the Regional Board. We need to know from them that we have a project that is permittable. And that may take some education on our part, teaching them a little bit more, because staff comes in and goes out. You know, we lose people at the agencies and we gain people. But we make the investment of the time to meet with them. We bring them out on site. We maybe take them to other sites as well. Because in the end, that potentially less experienced person has to write the permit. So we help them with that. We give them examples of other permits that we've done. But it is a lengthy process. There are permits from the uh, Regional Board Division of Drinking Water. If we use ultraviolet uh, as the uh, disinfectant process, um, we won't know the actual limitations on that equipment operation until it's up and operational. Because the Regional Board doesn't want to give you a pass and say, oh yeah, I'm sure it'll work out, close the door, and good luck. They want to know up front, it is working. You said it would work in this manner, and now we want to have proofing of that by sampling it, and then we'll look at the results. So it's probably not as bad as I'm making it out to be. It occurs frequently throughout the design development process and then throughout the construction process for some of the permits. Air quality is similar. There's a uh, authority to construct, and then later on, when you're operational, there's a permit to operate. So there's two elements that come from one agency at different times of the development of the project. Okay, any other questions? Jim, I'm hoping you can leave us on a high note. There, there's a lot of money being thrown around, uh, infrastructure bills, code relief, whatever. Are you seeing anything on a federal or state level that might benefit this project? The interesting thing is that you're not, you're a quasi-governmental agency is how I would describe. Maybe that's an unfair characterization. But you're not really a government agency. You're not a 501c3. 501c3s and government agencies have the availability of a uh, state revolving fund. If you wanted a low interest loan, it would be about 1%. Um, there's a, and then there's a state grant program, water reclamation bond law, that provides small grants up to about two million. We've gotten them about about two million dollars. Um, I'm hopeful that we can take the concept that we've presented to you and that we've done in other projects and bring it directly to the state board and show them how implementation of the program that they're working on, how because they're right now they're saying. How are we going to spend these billions of dollars on infrastructure? And there may be some success in going up and doing a little lobbying with you and, and with Tim and whoever else wants to come. And you know, be very focused and very targeted about the way that we can help them spend some of that money. Not out of the question at all. We've successfully done that on some other projects. We'd be very happy to help them spend yeah. some of their money. So, the, and there is—I'll mention very briefly. There's a program called WIFIA, Water uh, 
I, I always say, I'll get you the acronym. It, it, it came off of a transportation program at the federal level. The interesting thing about it is um, for-profit entities are eligible. But it's really designed for bigger projects. And they have billions of dollars uh, available. So that is another pathway we would just have to talk about. There's some upfront costs if they determine that you're eligible as an applicant, they want $100,000 to make that determination, the EPA. Great, thank you. All right, thank you very much for that update. Uh, Tim, I don't think there's any action for the board to take at this time, but uh, appreciate the uh, update from Jim and his team. All right, uh, moving on. Um, I think, is it Joel or Tim talking about uh, errors and omissions? Joel? I'm waiting for Joel, I can just give you an update. So um, last December, Golden Rain was a resident, a new resident, um, was unhappy with their purchase of a home. Uh, it had to do with a carport that the seller, the owner, the past owner, had sold and deeded to somebody else, but then never notified the mutual or GRF. And that caused a whole series of things to happen. They threatened legal action on the mutual, on, on GRF, the real estate brokers, et cetera, et cetera. And so what happened was the owner had sold it many years ago, and then he passed away. And so the estate had no knowledge of this and assumed that the carport was, was, was part of the title to the property. So, any, so GRF got dragged into this. It, long story, I cut to the chase here. Um, we ended up having to settle with that buyer only because GRF and the mutual were looked at as a deep pocket. Neither GRF nor the mutual believed that there was any liability on the part of, a, of either entity, but the cost to go to court would have far exceeded the amount of the settlement just to go and defend ourselves. So it was the recommendation of our attorney, it was a recommendation of you know, all the parties at the time that this should just be settled. So that led to a change, a proposed change in our property management agreement with the mutuals to make it very clear that GRF is a directed agent and should have no liability for anything like that. The, the mutuals didn't agree. So that had led then to further negotiations with the mutuals, which are still ongoing. And, um, and then it led to us looking at our insurance policies more carefully, more closely to see what kind of coverages we had. So you all, as, as the directors and officers of this corporation, you have what's called directors and officers insurance, liability insurance. And what that does is that if there's any actions that you take, that, that you take in good faith, that lead to harm another party for whatever reason, you are protected under the insurance policy for that decision. You cannot be sued personally for that. And good faith was the, was the key word. If you, if you take an action not in good faith or you do something that was actually illegal, uh, contrary to the advice of your professional advisors, your attorney, your CPA, or engineers, or whomever, um, then you could have uh, personal liability that would not be covered by DNO. But DNO covers, you know, assuming you're all operating in good faith, you're covered. But the rest of the corporation is not. And that's what we learned through this process is that there's a thing called errors and in omissions insurance, E and O, as opposed to D and O. Errors and omissions is similar to D and O, except it covers all the other staff, all the other people that work for the Golden Rain Foundation. And the area probably of the greatest risk is um, in our member records department. They process between 450 and 550 or so transfers of ownership every year. It's a very technical, very legal process. Uh, most of those go very smoothly, the vast majority do. And there's also hundreds of refinances. In all of those cases, refinances and, and membership transfers, all have the potential for risk to the corporation. And, and in fact, that is what this, the carport person was alleging, was that there was, you know, GRF and the mutual should have known that the owner sold his property, his carport. But that was, a, that was really the seller's responsibility and the title company's responsibility. But as I said, to go and defend ourselves against that claim, we would have spent much more than the amount we settled for. So um, E&O insurance 
would step in in that case, up to, you know, beyond the deductible amount. So, uh, and then the other insurance, just because we were evaluating all of our insurances as a result of this incident earlier, or at the end of last year, um, we also determined that we might not have adequate environmental coverage. So we have, we have two fuel tanks. One is up at MOD, the other is over at the golf maintenance yard. Uh, underground fuel or, or above ground, uh, we've got other kinds of liquids and that kind of thing that are in tanks. Um, we have chlorine in huge drums at the fitness center, for example, and chlorine is a, is a toxic chemical. We do have uh, an amount of coverage, I'll let Joel talk about it, but we determine that there's other risks as, as vehicles are bringing, transporting that stuff here, that there could be a spill. A via, and one of these big tankers you know, has a car accident and leaks this stuff into the creek or people get sick and buy this. So we may not have enough. So we got quotes on environmental uh, cover, expansion of our environmental coverage as well. So I'll let Joel provide you the details of those. Okay, so on the uh, air and emissions uh, coverage, uh, we have uh, some options with respect to uh, coverage limits. Uh, the first is a million dollars of coverage limit with a deductible of $25,000, and the annual premium is $22,380. Um, the other option is coverage limit for $2 million, the same deductible at 25,000 with a premium of $33,500. So uh, the staff recommendation along with the finance committee recommendation is for the $2 million policy. This would, uh, one of the evaluation points were the values of our homes within Rossmore and certainly many of them exceed 1 million um, and uh, I believe most are, or none or exceed 2 million or in that, in that general area. So our recommendation is uh, error and emissions policy for the $2 million coverage. And then on the environmental side, um, you know, as Tim has uh, spoken, we do have um, a policy that covers our tanks, um, any, any uh, damages associated with that. Um, and we do have in our auto policy uh, minor spills uh, associated with the vehicles. But what we are presently missing is any, um, any, any uh, damages associated with a, uh, with a tank spill, a, a big rig turning over, um, as, as Tim described, you know, affecting uh, the environment or the creek. So that essentially is our exposure at this point. So there's a variety of options which you have there in front of you. Um, again, staff and the finance committee is recommending a policy uh, of $3 million. It has a $25,000 deductible. It is more cost effective to uh, do a three-year policy uh, based on the proposal. The, the premium that would cover the three years is $43,302, which is a cost per year of 14,434, as opposed to a $3 million single year policy for $24,056. Any questions? Kathleen. Okay, so for the error and um, uh, admissions um, insurance, uh, you're recommending a $2 million uh, insurance policy. Can you give an example of something that would happen that would require a payment of two million dollars? Maybe as again as Tim was describing there are a lot of uh, transactions in member records associated with title transfers. A value of a home could be again close to that two million dollars. So if there is if there is an error or a mistake associated with member records that that caused a situation to where we would be responsible for the value of the home? How likely is that? I mean, it, I mean this, this incident we had was, we paid, yeah. you know, uh, what was it, uh, 5,000. So it's a long way from 5,000 to 2 million. It, absolutely, but if we take a look at the difference in premium from a $1 million policy to a $2 million policy, it's, 
you know, maybe about $11,000 on an annual basis. I would say for that extra million dollars of coverage, I would say it's worth the um, peace of mind uh, that if damages do occur and if they do exceed $1 million, um, an additional $11,000 per year is, in my opinion, worth it. Other questions? Could I ask a question? So uh, it seems to me another area of risk is uh, alterations, uh, inspections, uh, that may even be more riskier than uh, member records. Are they covered by this as well? Yes, so uh, MOD is technically part of GRF, although it's a separate division, but, but certainly there are uh, building maintenance uh, and uh, construction type of activities that, uh, that uh, occur within MOD for the mutual, so those activities would be covered as well. Tim? There would also be things like uh, contract review. You know, we enter into a lot of contracts, both GRF, on behalf of the GRF entity, and on behalf of the mutual. So if staff made an error in a contract and there was an economic loss, um, you know, or harm or what, injury, whatever, and mutual's upset about it, or the vendor's upset about it, or resident's upset about it, potentially that could be a claim under e &O, if there was an error in, you know, in the paperwork kind of a thing. So I think there, there's a lot of different types of exposures here. I think our greatest risk is with the member records department. This type of coverage is common with real estate professionals. If you're a real estate agent or a broker or an escrow company, they would have an errors and omissions for exactly this reason, that you just, people can sue you for whatever, and whether it's legitimate or not, but there is the chance that we make a mistake. And um, there was another incident just uh, about 10 days ago that might be a mistake, and we're still trying to evaluate that in the member records department. I mean, they, they process literally thousands of transactions, tens of thousands of pa pages of paperwork. It's very easy somewhere in there to find a mistake, and you can probably find a mistake everywhere. I mean, we all are, all are not perfect, but what's the likelihood of it leading to a claim or an, er you know, an injury or somebody f suffering financial harm or whatever? Um, I, two million dollars, as Jill said, the, the price difference between a million and two million in coverage is pretty nominal. And, and two million dollars would be the outside event or case that somebody is suing because they got into a property they shouldn't have gotten into or we made an error in the processing and somebody else ended up owning the property. Who knows? But let's say it's the whole house, and what's the greatest exposure we would have? It's about $2 million is the limit for the, the upper end of the home values in Rossmore. So, and as he said, it's a pretty nominal increase in premium from, to go from a million to two million, it's only, what, $11,000? Right. So it's pretty affordable, <clears throat> relative, relative for the peace of mind and the safety that I think this would afford you. And, and both policies, the error in emissions and the environmental, has legal coverage. So it will, obviously, up to the deductible, it would cover our legal fees. And Tim, in, our, in negotiations with the mutuals on the MOD contract, uh, errors and omissions was an important item to the mutuals, as I recall. They are waiting to hear what your answer is before we, they will finalize our agreement with them. Because it has a bearing. If now this gets into really complicated stuff, but Golden Rain cannot be in the property management business if the assets of the Golden Rain Foundation are placed at risk to do property management. So, if there's a loss or a claim, a judgment, an award against GRF for providing property management services, the only way that that can work is if we set up a cost-sharing model f amongst the mutuals for any claim that GRF might be involved in that does not include gross negligence. Gross negligence, we're on the hook for that. Or fraud, you know, something that's an intentional willful misconduct, that kind of thing. But, but a mistake, an unintentional mistake, an error, those kinds of things that result in liability, a claim, an award, a judgment. Golden Rain's assets cannot be placed at risk. The trust assets can't be at risk. So it, this gets pretty complicated, um, and that's the part that we're waiting on. The, the mutuals are waiting on your answer whether you're going to take E&O coverage. Because if you don't, that, we're back to the negotiation table with the mutuals to try to resolve 
kind of this impasse on, on really on property management, on indemnification, which is the, the root of their issue. So uh, do we have a motion? Oh, thank you, Mary. I move that the board acquire policies with a $2 million limit for errors and emission insurance and a $3 million limit for environmental insurance. Do we have a second? Second. Dale? Any discussion? Paul? The um, environmental, which, which is that for three years? That's the recommendation yes. is a three-year policy. That should be part of the motion, yes? It is. It was. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, have a, I have a question about the two million. Is that per occurrence or total over the year? It is, uh, it is per occurrence. Okay. Any other discussion items or questions? Uh, Tim? But I think it was... Two million per occurrence, but also two million in the aggregate. That is correct. Yeah, in so the that's the limit is two million. So if we had multiple claims, w our limit would be two million dollars in total. So it is limit. Yeah. Per year, or per policy year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I think we're ready for. Oh, Tim? One, one more thing. Yes. So because this is something we discovered after the fiscal year began. It's not budgeted, so you just, I wanna make sure you understand that it's not part of the 2021 budget. So if we acquire this, it will be coming out of our surplus funds. We have significant surplus funds to, that can more than afford this, but I wanted you to know that it's not a budgeted cost. Yeah. We will budget for it in 2022, if you approve. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deborah. I think we're ready for a vote. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Stumfill? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Harrington? Yes. And Madaraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, uh, last item I believe on the agenda is in terms of committee appointments. I wanna just say that uh, there were 11 openings uh, for resident uh, advisory committee positions. We had 19 applicants, which is just outstanding. Mm -hmm. I uh, appreciate everybody stepping forward. I think a lot of that was due to the recruiting video that the Finance and Audit Committee did, uh, starring myself in the opening. It was quite <laughs> gripping. Uh, but I wanna thank everybody for being a big part of that. Uh, so with that, I, wanna, I want to recommend uh, the following folks. On the Aqu Aquatics Advisory Committee, Vivian Clayton, Catherine Robinson Walker, no relationship, Ben Wright, Audit Committee, Alan Smith, Finance Committee, uh, Bill Dorban to serve the one-year term of um, uh, Gene Autry, David Kirkpa Kirkpatrick and Diane Portnoff, Fitness Center Advisory Committee, Alice King and Louis Venagas, Golf Advisory Committee, Teddy Swanson. Uh, I should also note that um, Carl Brown has resigned from the Planning Committee, effective immediately, and so I am uh, recommending uh, Kathleen Stumfell as a replacement for Carl on the planning committee, and also that uh, chairs for committees for the upcoming year would be Brian Stack for Aquatics, Merrick Lipson for Audit Committee, Bill Dorban, Finance Committee, and Jim Grizel for fi Fitness Center Advisory Committee, and John McDonald, Golf Advisory Committee. I make a motion on the well-stated uh, comments that you just made. I think I, I think I like that. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> Mary, thank you. Any discussion? We love volunteers, so thank you, everybody. Let's take a vote. Deborah? Walker? Yes. Stumpo? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Uh, announcements, there will be no mid-month, though. No, more. Excuse more. me. Yes, Tim. We, have, we, have, we had an emergency item we added to the agenda last night. I forgot to write that down. Yes, yeah. here we go. Do you want me to Yes, say? please. All right, so um, I don't have any information for you in your packet. I don't have really any details. There's an emergency authorization for spending that has just occurred yesterday. Um, there was a sewage, uh, <laughs> so we're talking about sewage. There was a sewage 
uh, major sewage overflow spill up at MOD last month. It um, affected, and that's where we have you know, the whole operations for MOD. It, it permeated over a weekend, unfortunately, got into the, all the carpet, all the hard, the uh, vinyl flooring, and into the walls. So all of the, that has been cleaned up and removed, but we got the results of the, um, I don't know, sampling and testing, whatever the testing that's required, and the results came back yesterday and indicate that we have to, rem the cleaning it wasn't good enough. It has to actually be replaced, as does the drywall, the sheetrock at the base of the- P Portions of the sheetrock. Portions of it, yeah. Maybe. So thanks, Paul. Yeah. So Paul, you want to provide any other details on this? Well, the, the, the flooring itself is, is 14 years old. The useful life on carpet and flooring is anywhere from eight to 10. So we're, we're well beyond that. Uh, but the, when the, uh, the sewage uh, spill occurred, backup occurred, it, it essentially affected all of the accounting office and parts of the building maintenance office uh, the, the women's bathroom, the hallways, um, the the far end was was not affected, but it, it really doesn't make sense to only do half the building when you're looking at 15-year-old carpet. Uh, so I've been uh, trying to get estimates during this meeting, and actually a few of them have come in, um, and we're we're looking at about $150,000 to do all the work. Um, we will not have to relocate staff the way we would would do it is do it on a weekend. Uh, move all the all the cubicles, take them down, move everything out into the parking lot, and do them do it in two phases, so it'd be over two different weekends, so we can uh, keep the operation moving. But uh, it's it's unfortunate, but uh, you know it's it's really not something where you want to be working with that in the area. <clears throat> Any questions, Dale? Yeah, Paul, because this is occurring so. So tight frame for us. Would it would it be better if it's, if if we pass an, an amount not to exceed something, so that you have some room? I, I think work? that's what we're asking for, um, and I think 150k would do it. Originally, I had talked to Tim about 200,000, uh, but I, the the way the bids have come in, the 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 flooring pricing isn't as high as I thought it would be. And so I think we're safe with 150. If we need to come back for more, I guess we could, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Well, if we did an amount not to exceed, then that gives you a little sure. bit of flexibility. Sure. If, I mean, I'm, if we have 200,000, that's, then I don't have to worry about it at all. But I'm thinking around 150 is where it's gonna come in. Okay. Okay, Kathleen and then Ted. So my question is, the sewage problem has been fixed? <laughs> Good question. I was waiting for that one. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a real problem. Um, this is not the first time it's happened. This is the first time that it's gone that far down the hall. We've kind of always just cleaned it and said, let's just keep going. Uh, we did get it cleared. We feel like we, we uh, really got it cleared this time. But uh, before we do anything, we're going to uh, run a TV camera through that line and make sure that it's flowing. Uh, but it's, just, it's an old building, and uh, there's some big sycamore trees right over the sewer line. We took one of them out. Uh, we had a, a backup a month previous to that as well, and that time we took out one of the sycamores. Okay, uh, Ted? Um, you said there's some flooring and some rug. Is it advantageous to go one way or the other instead of having a mix, or are you going to do it exactly the way Oh, it I think we need to do it exactly the way it is. The, the uh, linoleum is in, in the bathrooms the hallway and the break room. So you don't really want to put carpet in there. And remember, we have workmen coming in and out also, so we need a pretty high industrial strength material. Paul, and then Kathleen. Um, what has been the environment there for staff during this period? Have there been fumes and other things that staff have had to smell slash uh, you know, be affected by? Well, in the beginning, when it was wet, of course, and I think some people work from home. As uh, I happen to be on vacation. Honestly, had I not been on vacation, I would have had the carpet pulled right there, and we would have just gotten rid of it. But I wasn't there, so that didn't happen. Okay, uh, and would there be any benefit to moving staff out and doing it all in a week? I can't see how you're going to get sheetrock done over two weekends and, you know, painted and... 
I think we'll have to put up work. with some construction, which we're, we're used to. Uh, we'll have to get into that when we, we start get, I haven't got the remediation estimate yet, so I'm not sure what's gonna be involved in that. Uh, last time we did a carpet replacement was 2007, and they were able to do the whole thing in one weekend, hmm. but that didn't involve the remediation. Okay. Kathleen? Uh, I would like to make a motion that the board approve emergency repair um, money of an amount not to exceed um, 200000 for the repair of the MOD flooring and walls from the sewage spill. From the, wait, wait, from the trust estate fund. From the trust estate fund. Do we have I'll a second? second. No, Mary. Okay, any discussion? All right, let's take a vote. Deborah? Walker? Yes. Stumfield? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Mataraki? Yes. Unanimous. All right, we thank you. Just a note to follow that up, uh, the Finance Committee had reported there might be $900,000 available to spend in the Trust Estate Fund that is now down to $700,000. So, uh, there is only one pocketbook there. Uh, so announcements, uh, there will be no me mid-month meeting and the next meeting is here in the Peacock Room, uh, Thursday, July 29th at 9 a.m. We are now adjourned to executive session. I get to use it again. Thank you, everybody.